Okay. Good afternoon. Welcome to our 2 p.m. session of the January 12th, 2021 meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television, channel 25, and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I wanna thank the public for staying home to, review, to view today's city council meeting. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, please call in at the beginning of the item you're wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have comment, commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Watkins? Here. Kalantari Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Golder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? Present. Thank you. Before we um, get into our first presentation today, I just wanted to um, just have a moment of silence um, to recognize the officers um, who were killed at the Capitol um, last Wednesday, and also to just uh, take a moment to just show our solidarity uh, regarding, um, I believe, something we all share, which is that we believe in our democracy and, and we don't see um, tyranny and the things that happened last week as something that is acceptable to, to us in the US. So I hope I speak for all of you, um, but I would appreciate just maybe just taking a quick moment of silence to recognize and um, you know just um, really just acknowledge uh, what happened last week. It's, I think, greatly impacted our, everyone that saw it and so we'll do that real quick. Thank you. And on to, uh, on to uh, much more joyous things. Um, our first item this today uh, is a mayor mayoral proclamation declaring January 12th, 2021 as Sharon Esto, Esther, sorry, Sharon, Sharon Esther Popo, LCSW Day. And Sharon, I'd like to, there you are. I love your background. Yay. <laughs> Um, Sharon, it is my great honor um, in declaring January 12th as your day here in the city of Santa Cruz. And um, I'd like to read a couple of lines from the proclamation, which typically we would be in the city council chambers and you would be able to see this beautiful proclamation. Um, I will read some lines from it and um, we certainly will get this to you as a recognition of all your work that you've done. Um, for our community. So I'll read a few lines here. For over 15 years, Sharon Esther Popo has been a community activist in the Santa Cruz County community, standing for justice and lived equality for the LGBTQ plus community. And whereas for the past eight years, Sharon Esther Popo has served as the executive director of the Diversity Center of Santa Cruz County. And whereas, Sharon Popo, Esther Popo has successfully led the Diversity Center through numerous funding policy and pandemic challenges. And whereas with Sharon Esther, Esther, Esther Popo's leadership, the Diversity Center tripled its financial support from community members, governmental agencies and foundations, allowing for greatly expanded services to the LGBTQ plus community and its two-year $1 million safe harbor capital campaign, which has created a larger and more permanent center for the LGBTQ plus community. Now, therefore, I, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim 
Tuesday, January 12, 2021, as Sharon Esther Popo LC SW Day in City of Santa Cruz. And Sharon, um, just for the just for the broader um, council, um, I want the council to really understand the significance of what happened in December, which is that the diversity center um, closed and raised all of the money to close on um, buying the diversity center building, rehabilitating it, and um, uh, really just they, they've put a true uh, they've put a true stone down in this town, and it's um, it's not going anywhere. It's not going to move anymore. They found home, and uh, due to Sharon's leadership, that uh, we, she achieved that. Uh, right in the lasting few days of your of your time there, and um, also I think many people saw the the press recently. Uh, you also had a significant court win in the past week as well, standing up for LGBTQ plus rights. So, Sharon, I'd love to have you say a few words, and um, council members, please, um, if you would like to say a few words, just raise your hand. But Sharon, I'd love to turn it over to you, and just want to say thank you and. Um, just extremely proud to know you, and uh, I think you've done amazing things for our community. And you'll have to unmute yourself. There you go. Thank you so much. This means so much to me. Such a such an honor. And first, I want to give a, a huge shout out to the the board, staff, and volunteers at the Diversity Center because all of those accomplishments happen because of a a wonderful uh, group of committed individuals who who all came together and love this organization and stand proud for the LGBTQ plus community in Santa Cruz County. So a huge shout out. This is all of ours, and it feels really really humbling and wonderful to, to be acknowledged. And I, I also want to give a shout out to Deanna Zachary and Ashlyn Adams, who I am passing the, the torch to, the leadership torch at the Diversity Center, and they are taking over as interim executive directors to, to bring the Diversity Center from, from strength to strength. Well, congratulations, Sharon, and I'll open it up to uh, Council Member Watkins. Thanks, Mayor, and I just wanted to just say a few words, just how much I've appreciated working with you, Sharon. Um, also in my capacity in education, your advocacy for our LGBTQI plus youth has just been um, inspiring and essential to their school safety and their well-being as they enter into adulthood. And the Diversity Center serves such a remarkable space that's safe for our youth, which is so important. And your leadership has been extraordinary over these past eight years. And I just wish you the absolute best in next steps and next life adventures for you. So it's truly been an honor working with you, and I look forward to staying connected with you in a different way. So yay for today being your day. <laughs> <laughs> and Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Congratulations, Sharon. Um, Sharon, I experience you as joy and compassion for yourself, for people around you and everyone in the community. Uh, thank you for everything you've contributed that I know you'll continue to contribute. Um, in particular, thank you for all the work you've done for the LGBTQ plus youth in our community. We've worked quite a bit around substance use prevention and addressing youth and young adult homelessness. Um, so thank you. Congratulations. Any other council members? Just a big round of applause in our very good Zoom way here. Sharon, congratulations, and we really wish you all the best. Um, hopefully you'll get some uh, well-earned rest and uh, enjoy your your family for a while, and um, hopefully you're not, like, I don't think you're going anywhere, so I'm sure we'll see you around. And I also just um, also want to acknowledge your board and as you said, your, your staff and all the leadership that your uh, that the diversity center has been bringing um, with regards to all these important issues for our community. So thank you and congratulations. We'll miss you. Yay. Okay, moving on to item the next item. I do have a few announcements and then we'll move on to our regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. 
Please note, public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meetings are numbered items six through 13 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if there are any statements of disqualification today. Seeing none, I will move on. I'd like to ask the city clerk administrator to announce any additions and deletions to the agenda. There are none. I will, we are, will now um, uh, move on to oral communications. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications today will occur immediately or after agenda item 13. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in towards the end of item number 13. And we will move on to the city attorney report on closed session. I'd like to call on the city attorney to provide a report on, on the closed session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Myers, members of the city, members of the city council. Um, this afternoon, the council met in closed session at uh, 1 p.m. via Zoom to uh, discuss the following items. The first was a conference with legal counsel concerning liability claims, uh, the claims of Brittany Ballin, uh, Gabriella Chapa, Bristol Santa Cruz LLC, and Dan L. Ebert. Uh, those items are also listed on your consent calendar uh, this afternoon as a, a agenda item 10. Secondly was a conference with legal counsel concerning existing litigation. First case that was discussed was the case Santa Cruz Homeless Union et al. versus the City of Santa Cruz currently pending in the U.S. District Court in San Jose. Second case was uh, the case of Save Our Big Trees versus City of Santa Cruz, uh, currently pending in the Superior Court. Uh, there was no reportable action on those items. However, I will um, just mention that uh, item seven on your consent calendar is related to the uh, Save Our Big Trees case. Thank you, Mr. Kondati. Uh, we will now Move on to uh, the city manager's report. Uh, Mr. Verdahl, would you like to give us a report? Yes, uh, what I was gonna do this afternoon is to um, ask our, first our police chief, uh, uh, Chief Mills, to do an update on the uh, concerns surrounding uh, potential violence uh, around the inauguration uh, date around the country and in our community. And then afterwards also our fire chief, uh, uh, Chief Haidu to give us an update on COVID as it relates to what we're experiencing as far as the numbers as well as the vaccinations uh, process. So first I'll turn it over to uh, Chief Mills. Thank you. Thank you, Manager Bernal, and uh, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Myers and council members. Uh, just to give you an update on where we stand uh, nationwide, we've got a, a situational report from the FBI and some of the other intelligence agencies in the nation to alert us to the fact that uh, there are concerns, serious concerns over violence surrounding uh, the uh, transition of power in Washington and the inauguration of uh, President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris. And we are taking that seriously. We have read the reports. We are collecting local information on top of it to make sure that uh, we're looking at the threat streams as they come in, if in fact there are threat streams, and then preparing operational plans to ensure uh, for the safety of our community. Uh, to be uh, direct, we will do everything within our power to make sure that people have the right to protest, the right to address government, the right to be heard, uh, what we cannot accept and will not accept is any violence associated with that. And uh, we are, uh, have uh, plenty of staffing available. We have plans in place. We have alerted all of our colleagues in the region to make sure that we have the support we need uh, in case uh, something does touch off uh, here locally. On top of that, uh, Mayor Myers and I created a video today that will be released a little bit later. Uh, as well as a press release that will be coming out uh, from the city to make sure that uh, people are informed and aware and comfortable that uh, we are ready and we've thoroughly thought this through and we've been prepared to deal with any threats that may come our way. Um, 
The intelligence uh, is uh, poignant. We do not, I uh, want to be clear, we do not expect there to be violence here in our city. Uh, we, there are no specific threats to our area of responsibility. However, we're continuing to search and I'm getting reports every day from our investigators uh, to make sure that uh, the, threats, the threat picture does not change for our, our area of responsibility. So um, if anything were to come up, I will make sure that I keep the city manager and the mayor informed and uh, within the uh, proper guidelines of the Brown Act, uh, we would get information to everybody as appropriate. Uh, so that you are aware of what's going on in our in our city and our in our area of responsibility. That's really about all I had. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Committee council members have questions for Chief Mill. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Martine, is additional items for city manager report? Yep, uh, we'll have uh, Chief Hyduke now do an update on the COVID-19 status. Mayor, City Council, Jason Hyduke, your fire chief. I'm gonna give a brief update on the status of COVID and also um, hopefully outline some of the questions regarding vaccinations that have come up. Um, what you're seeing right now is a, um, this is from a county health um, uh, page for COVID, and I would recommend that anyone go to that website if you have questions. It is updated, and this is a public health emergency, and this is very much a um, public health uh, run um, problem. What you're seeing on this screen is just the state of COVID here within Santa Cruz County, and uh, you can see there's been a significant spike starting uh, right around Thanksgiving, and they expect that this is going to continue because of travel and gatherings over the holidays. Uh, the last spike that we had within our community was in the summertime back in July. And the numbers are, are growing. Um, our hospitals are full. Uh, they are, are able to take care of people, but um, our numbers are mirroring what's happening in uh, the rest of the state. Um, and so they, they really want people to pay attention to that. And if you look at where the, the majority of transmissions are occurring, it is person to person household. It is in uh, close quarters, in close space with people that uh, know each other. Um, and so all those measures as far as face coverings, hand washing, social distancing, uh, that's really what they're uh, recommending. Um, so that's where we are as far as uh, COVID. And again, this is uh, the county health office um, and you can go to the county website and they, they, they do update this. We go to the next slide. So vaccines um, are coming into our community and there's been a lot of talk about, um, and I've gotten these questions from, uh, from my mother, from my wife, from my friends, you know, how do I get a vaccine? And really this is a uh, federal and state run uh, process where the um, allocated doses are, are projection. Uh, those are approved at the state and submitted to the federal level before the vaccines are brought in. The federal, um, they, they authorize the order and they submit the request to the manufacturer for those vaccines. So currently the, the physical possession of the vaccines and the ordering of them is a uh, state and federal public health run uh, process for how that gets into our community. And the next slide. And there's, there's four main uh, distribution points and they're all being ramped up um, as we speak. And again, this is outside the city. This is uh, within the county and at the state level for uh, public health. The federal pharmacy program uh, is one mechanism, multi-county entities, the CalVax, and then your local health jurisdiction. And so the federal and CalVax and local health, I think people are familiar with that. What multi-county entities, what that means is uh, healthcare systems that are in place that can be, uh, can, that can vaccinate. And you're going to see that uh, come up and that would be Kaiser, that would be Sutter, uh, that would be PAMP, that those healthcare organizations are approved for an allotment of vaccines that are within the parameters that, um, that the public health officer and the state health officer and federal are, are recommending. And if you go to the next screen, where you're seeing this, and this again, you can find this on the county website. These are the tiers um, or phases, uh, depending if you're on the federal or state level for um, how they are allocating these vaccines uh, being distributed. And so if you have a, health, a public health office um, and they make a request, this 
and they, they get X amount of vaccines, these are the tiers that they're working through. Right now, we are currently in phase 1A, and those are basically healthcare providers. Those are nurses in our ICUs, those are paramedics in the field, um, and then also really high, um, high risk populations uh, within our skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities. Um, and they are working through this right now. They're um, optimistic that they can get through this by the end of next week, hopefully. And then they'll start moving through the, the next uh, uh, tiers or phases um, for prioritization of those um, vaccines. And as you can see, it includes law enforcement, it includes uh, you know, critical uh, infrastructure, and then it starts breaking down into age groups. And so what I would ask of um, everyone, uh, regardless of who your employer is or what you uh, fit within, that you are aware of where you fall within these tiers. And if you have access to healthcare, whether it's Kaiser or PAMP or Sutter or whatever um, provider you have or the you know, local uh, uh, county health office, that you know where you fall within these tiers so when they start rolling these out and they become available that you uh, take advantage of that. But again, this is not a city run program. We are not determining um, access to this. This is um, you know, through the state and through the county that is an arm of the state. And so these, um, as, they run in, as they run through these phases, they expect sometime in spring to get down to phase two um, after they get through uh, the initial phase one. And then as more and more vaccines are available, they will uh, push those out uh, following these parameters. So. It's unfortunate that, uh, uh, that it's not as robust as it could be, um, but I'm optimistic that we are starting to put vaccines into people and that is the beginning of ending the pandemic that we're in right now and uh, returning uh, to normal as soon as possible. Any questions? Questions from council members? Uh, Council Member Golder. Um, a question that's come to me, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer it, is, has, um, is, is regarding the allotment per county. And so uh, people are asking, you know, if they're in Santa Clara County or Monterey County, are they on different, different um, tiers and why? I don't, I'm, I don't have an answer. I don't know if you do or anybody does. Um, I don't know about the allotment per county. I believe it's based on population. It's also based on what, um, what numbers they have within those tiers. But that allotment is, um, there's requests that are made from the local level up to the state that's approved um, from the federal level. And so how those exact allotments are made, I, I, I don't know that. Um, but again, that is, uh, this is very much in the public health realm, uh, both at the state and the federal level. Councilmember Watkins. Um, thank you for the presentation and overview. I don't know if you have an answer to this question, um, but you know we have the identification of the new strand that's more highly contagious. Have I know they found that strand in California, but have they seen any patients locally that have contracted that version of the coronavirus that you know of? I, I'm not aware of that specific virus being in our community yet. And my understanding of it is that it's not necessarily more dangerous um, as far as the effects of it. Um, however, it is more contagious and that is the concern. Um, but I'm not aware of that, that strain or that variation being uh, within the county at this point. But um, and, and I'm sure if they do detect it, that that would be something that the public health officer would um, communicate. Okay, great, thank you. Councilmember Cummings. Thanks for that presentation. I just had a quick question. I know that um, we now have a testing site at the Civic, and I'm just wondering for members of the public, what's the best way for them to get access to, to testing at that site? So uh, I, again, like uh, I started off with, this is a county health uh, emergency and they're very much at the forefront of this and we partner with them uh, opening up that site at the Civic. Uh, if you go to the county health um, or go to the county health or the county webpage, there's a COVID-19 and if you click on that, there is questions about employers, there's questions about vaccines and also testing. Um, and anyone can get tested. 
you have to create a profile and make an appointment. And once that's done, you can uh, get tested for you or your family. You don't have to be symptomatic. You don't have to um, have an exposure. You can get tested. Um, but you do have to go on and create that um, profile. I believe you can do it in person uh, at the site itself. And there's numerous testing sites available to the public throughout the county. The Civic is one of them, and it's very convenient uh, within our city right here. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other uh, council members with questions? I have one if no one else is everybody good. Just a quick comment, uh, maybe just to add to Tony and thank you for the, re the report. Um, I did attend the, there was a weekly um, mayor's briefing that the county is doing again because we're, because of the status that we're in. Um, and there was a, a phone number that um, was announced by Dr. Newell. They have sort of established a vaccine liaison um, in county, county health. Um, the number to that office is 454-4242. Um, that's 454-4242. The purpose of the liaison is to sort of field questions from the community and help people understand when various, um, uh, you know, batches are coming in, sort of just understanding, really understanding sort of how the phasing's working. Um, I believe also people can understand where they should call to get signed up to, to, you know, get ready to do the vaccine. So whether that's with their healthcare provider. So um, the liaison's office is really meant to try to help the public understand as much as possible about how to get the vaccine, where to go, um, and sort of the timeline on that. So that might be a, just a great number to just tuck in your notes as a council member in case you get any um, requests from constituents. Um, and also during that um, meeting last week, um, she also mentioned that um, there are additional ICU nurses coming into Santa Cruz County in the next week. Um, there, are, they, you know, we are maxed out, and they are um, having visiting nurses come in. They were able to secure a number of uh, visiting nurses to come and fill in because we are maxed out right now in our ICU. So. Um, you know, she, Dr. Newell, very much uh, emphasized that we are in crisis care mode right now, and we're this is a very, very serious situation. So, um, yeah, quite a sobering report from her. So, I just wanted to share some of that as well, um, since I was able to be uh, being on that call on uh, last Friday. Uh, anything else, Martine, from City Manager, on your report? No, no, okay. uh, no, thank you very much. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thanks, Martine. Thank you, Chief Mills and Chief Hydrick. Okay, we will uh, move on to item number five, which is um, the city council will review the meeting calendar attached. Um, I'll now call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There have been no updates. Great. Okay, we will move on to our consent items our consent agenda. First up is the consent agenda, and these are items six through 12 on our agenda for members of the public who are streaming this meeting. Now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items six through 12. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star nine to raise your hand, and listen to the queue saying you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to pull any agenda items? Hang on. I don't see any hands. I am going to make one correction on item number, item number nine the appointment of representatives. So I just need to make one correction on there. Are there any items who, are there any council members who wish to uh, only comment on any items? Sonia's hand. And clerk, I'm learning this job. Do I take those comments now before we go into taking public comment? Um. I don't think it matters. We don't have any hands raised. Okay, 
in the public, right? And the attendees, okay. Uh, Council Member Bruner, you wanted to make a comment on an item? I just wanted to note that I will be abstaining from item number eight, minutes of the December 8th, 2020 City Council meeting since I was not present at that meeting. Clerk, is that also necessary for member Kalantari Johnson as well? Um, it isn't. I can let Tony um, jump in, but it, it's not required for Vice Mayor Bruner either. Okay. Um, because if I, if I understand the city attorney, it's approving um, the content, not the validity so much. It's... it's um Essentially, it is approving the minutes as the official record of the meeting, and so uh, abstaining is not required. Uh, and and um, and that's the advice we've consistently given over the years. Okay. Do you still want to register um, as and as an abstaining uh, vice mayor Bruner? We can register that, no problem. You're muted again, Sonia. I'm sorry. Yes, if it's not necessary for that uh, for that record, yes. Um, however, for the vote uh, in in it as an official record of that meeting, then I don't need to abstain. Is my understanding? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. I'll move on to uh, if there are any members of the public that would like to speak at any on any to any item on the consent agenda, with the exception of items pulled by council members, which we have done at this point. Now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. Are there any members of the public who would like to? Let's see, pull an item. Are we seeing anybody? I, um, there are no hands raised. Okay, great. Um, the correction on item number nine that I'd like to make is that um, in my haste to fill this form out, um, for the revenue committee, I would like to seat um, Vice Mayor Bruner, not, not Council Member Golder. And I've notified both both folks. So Bonnie, can you record that? I got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm now looking for a motion on uh, the consent agenda. Can I have a motion to uh, move the consent agenda forward? Uh, I missed whoever raised the fir their, your hand first. I'll go ahead and look to uh, Council Member Watkins. Sure, I'll go ahead and move the consent agenda and um, note that you made a correction to item number nine in regards to the appointment. And I'll call on Council Member Golder. I'm sorry, I couldn't see who came up first, but I'll call on Council Member Golder. <laughs> a second, okay. Um, and can we have the vote, please? Clerk. Mm -hmm. Council Member Watkins? Aye. <coughs> Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Cummings. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. Mayor Myers. Sorry, and I keep wanting to call I keep wanting to call Justin Mayor Cummings today too. So <laughs> it's very awkward. Uh, aye. Okay. Thank you. We will now move on to our public hearing for the day. And that is agenda item number 13, public hearing for 418, 428, 440, 504, and 508 Front Street, application number CP18-0153. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, 
If this is an item we want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. If you're interested in commenting on 418-428-440-504-508 Front Street application number CP18-0153, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will be then set to two minutes. Prior to taking public comment, we will uh, go ahead and I will turn this over to um, our presenter today, which is Sam Hasher, principal planner from the city's planning department. And um, we will go ahead and start the presentation by the staff. Hi, good evening city council members. Um, Samantha Hasher from the current planning department. And um, I am here with you today to present the project that we refer to as the Front Riverfront Mixed Use Project. Can everyone see my screen? I'm gonna put it in the yeah. slideshow view. Can everybody see it okay? Yeah, great. Okay, great. Um, so this is a um, project that is um, a proposal for a seven story development consisting of three buildings with a ground floor and river facing commercial and 175 upper floor residential units. Um, the project requires approval of all the permits that you see listed on the screen before you. Um, it was heard by the Historic Preservation Commission on August 5th, 2020. It was heard by the Planning Commission on September 3rd, 2020. And both commissions provided recommendations of approval to the City Council. The item was heard by the City Council on November 10th, 2020, and it was continued to allow for staff to review last minute correspondence that was submitted by the California Coastal Commission. Um, the item was continued to December 8th, and um, the applicant requested a further continuance to today's date, which was granted. So um, I provided a full presentation of the project at the November 10th meeting. So I'd like to focus this meeting um, on our discussions with uh, the Coastal Commission staff and our follow-up analysis of the letters that we've received, um, but I'll also provide a brief summary of the project. So this is a project site here. It's located east of Front Street, between Front Street and the San Lorenzo River. The project site consists of five parcels that are proposed to be combined to create the project site. Um, as I mentioned, the project includes 175 residential condominiums and 11,500 square feet of commercial space facing both the Riverwalk and Front Street. It also includes the creation of a publicly accessible landscaped area between the building and the Riverwalk Path and two pedestrian passageways between Front Street and the river. The, uh, the building is seven stories and due to the grade of the levee, that results in six stories above ground floor commercial at the Front Street frontage and five stories above commercial at the Riverwalk frontage. Um, there's no disturbance on the river side of the levee or within the river channel. These three buildings are connected by basement and ground level parking, a parking garage. The project complies with all requirements of the downtown plan with some exceptions. The applicant's requesting that this south passageway here um, is located about 80 to 100 feet from the future extension of Elm Street rather than 50 feet as required in the downtown plan. Um, and they've requested this as a design variation and staff are supportive of that variation given that there are many variables associated with where that future extension of Elm Street is gonna be located. If it's a straight extension of Elm Street, it right now is located in the Metro site. And so we're currently evaluating how such an extension would cross the Metro site, how it would interact with bus movement or if it can be located in a similar area um, that would result in an active useful connection and not just dead space. Um, but for this project, for measurement purposes, we anticipated a straight extension of Elm and the passageway measured to um, 80 to 100 feet north of the extension. Um, so that is being requested as a design variation. Um, the applicant's also requesting a density bonus waiver. They're requesting a reduction in the step back, uh, the required 10 foot step back above 50 feet at the front and riverfront frontages. 
Um, the building does provide step backs. It just doesn't meet the required uniform 10 foot step back above 50 feet. Um, they're all requ also requesting as a density bonus waiver um, the addition of one story and uh, an increase in height of about 11 feet. Um, the application includes a density bonus incentive concession to allow for the um, elevators in the south pedestrian passageway to encroach into a required 10 foot step back above 35 feet. Um, the justification to support these requests was provided in the um, November 10th staff report to the city council and we've also provided those diagrams to you today as attachment K to your staff report. In accordance with CICA, CICWA, we also prepared a checklist and a, um, held a public scoping meeting to determine potential significant impacts of the project. Um, we knew that cultural resources uh, was an area that we needed to further evaluate given that the project includes the demolition of two buildings that are eligible for listing in our historic building survey. Um, but through that public scoping process, we also identified um, other areas to evaluate in the EIR, including energy, biological resources, geology and soils and land use. The draft and final EIR are attached to your staff report as exhibit E, um, attachment E. Um, we did receive public comments regarding concerns about soils and geology, particularly re related to the project impact on the levy. The applicant was required to evaluate these impacts both for our analysis in the EIR and as part of the Section 408 permit that they submitted to the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, the applicant submitted a geotechnical evaluation for seepage and slope stability, and that addressed the issue um, for the Section 408 permit. That report concluded, um, and I quote, the current numerical analysis shows that the proposed project will not have an adverse effect on the integrity and performance of the San Lorenzo River West project levy with regard to under seepage and slope stability problems as A, the exit flow gradient at the critical point of the development will not cause any quick conditions in the blanket layer and B, the factors of safety against slope failure for post-construction site conditions are significantly above the minimum criteria. Dewatering will be required during construction and the applicant has determined that they will obtain a permit from the Regional Water Quality Control Board to discharge the storm drain. Um, one of the, the bigger issues for the project was the potential for liquefaction and lateral spreading towards the river. The applicant further evaluated this impact in a report prepared by Rockridge Geotechnical. Um, who recommended the use of a mat foundation on soil strengthened with drilled displacement columns. Um, so these concerns were evaluated and the technical reports have and um, are available on our website for the public to review. Um, for the cultural resources, ultimately the uh, Historic Preservation Commission and the Planning Commission voted to recommend that the City Council certify the EIR and approve the project to allow for the demolition of the buildings with the added condition of approval that the project provide partial preservation to allow for the significant characteristics of the building to be conveyed in the um, features of the front facades. The applicant has already revised the building designs to incorporate um, these features and they specifically preserve the features that were called out in the historic evaluations as significant characteristics. So these um, facades would be provided in addition to the conditions of approval for photo documentation and an interpretive display on, on the site. Um, so now getting to the Coastal Commission letter. Uh, we received a letter from the Coastal Commission on November 10th at the public hearing for the project. The letter listed many concerns with the project and some we could tell were inaccurate right away, but others were not as clear. Um, so the item was continued to allow for us to review the letter and coordinate with Coastal Commission staff as the project is located in the appealable area of the coastal zone. Since the November 10th meeting, we have met with Coastal Commission staff twice. <laughs> Um, the first was uh, more of a general meeting to discuss um, the concerns with the project and the second meeting was more of a working meeting. We went through the um, details of the project and the applicable regulations of the downtown plan and discussed density bonus state law. The Coastal Commission staff noted 
three main areas of concern in their letter. Um, the first was that the inclusionary housing calculation provided by staff was not accurate. Um, that impacts to coast that the project would impact coastal resources due to the additional height um, and the cumul cumulative impacts of the variations that are being requested. Um, and the third is that the project should provide additional public benefits to justify the variations that are being requested. The Coastal Commission staff noted coastal resources being impacted, and they noted that that was visual and that the building was not compatible with the surroundings, but the staff didn't provide any additional details supporting these conclusions, such as which view shed would be impacted or how the building mass is not compatible with the downtown. They simply noted that a building that exceeds the maximum height allowed in the additional height zone results in a coastal resource impact. They did agree that the inclusionary housing calculation provided in the staff report was accurate. Um, and they agreed to write a follow-up letter to redact some of the inaccuracies. We did receive a follow-up letter on December 30th, 2020. Um, and that letter, um, it, it essentially restates their position in a more general and less project specific way. Um, the main points of that follow-up letter is that the city should use their discretion in approving variations from the LCP and that the city should require additional public benefits to allow for such variations. So I just want to give you a quick background on um, the process that went into adding the additional height zones to the downtown plan and the Coastal Commission impact, um, input at that time. Um, in 2017, we amended the downtown plan for various reasons. Um, one was to eliminate the recovery component because that was, um, the effort was essentially completed. Um, we also wanted to recognize the appropriateness um, of density, increased density in the downtown area, and that's due to it being a transit priority area, the benefit of the shared parking district, that it's within walking and biking distance of commercial and recreational areas. Um, and then in recognizing the appropriateness of this density, we um, increased the height of the buildings to 70 to 85 feet in certain areas. Um, we also strengthened the regulatory language to uh, better implement some longstanding goals in the general plan and in the downtown plan and in the San Lorenzo Urban River plan um, that seek to enhance the river as a natural amenity and as a recreational resource. These amendments were approved by the city council in 2017 and they were approved by the Coastal Commission in 2018. And um, what's important to note here is that in the Coastal Commission staff report, um, they evaluated these amendments for consistency with applicable Coastal Act policies, in, particularly, in particular those related to um, land use and visual resources and public access and recreation. The Coastal Commission staff found support for the amendments for all the reasons that we described, that it's um, an appropriate area for increased density, that it's a transit priority area, that it strengthens our requirements to highlight the river as a resource, um, and they specifically cited that the amendments allow for um, research, um, that it leverages the ability to build larger structures for design features that provide and enhance opportunities for public access and coastal recreation while avoiding significant adverse impacts to coastal resources. As such, the proposed IP changes can be found consistent with and adequate to carry out the certified LUP, and the proposed LUP changes can be found consistent with the Coastal Act. They also note, currently, the levee blocks street level views to the river in the downtown area, and the additional 20 to 35 feet of allowable building height in Pacific Avenue, between Pacific Avenue and the river walk will not block any public views that would, current, would exist currently if the area was developed to the pre present 50 foot limit. Um, and then below, um, I can't read them. So the um, Coastal Commission staff make a clear argument in support of the increased height and density as consistent with the Coastal Act in their own staff report. Um, the staff report also does call out um, the design criteria in the downtown plan um, for the additional height zone um, as design criteria that will limit the lateral extent of buildings and provide recessed facades that break up the building masses. So in this case, because they're asking for variations to those design criteria as a part of the density bonus, 
um, we evaluated those, uh, the impact of those variations on this particular site. Um, so I just want to provide an illustration here, or visual, um, to illustrate that the applicant is not requesting a full exemption from any of the requirements. Um, here is a, a line that represents approximately the 50 foot height limit. So pursuant to the downtown plan, this whole area below 50 feet could be completely built out to the property lines. And then above that 50 foot line, the buildings would have a uniform step back of 10 feet. So um, it would be, you know, the wedding cake design. The applicant is requesting flexibility to provide step back to varying depths throughout the height of the building and not just this uniform 10 foot step back. So um, they're providing a 37 by 20 foot step back at the middle of the center building. They're also providing four foot to 10 foot step backs at the corner of the building and 14 to 15 foot step backs at the top story. Um, and then on the southern building, they're providing three foot to six foot step backs, uh, five foot step back at the corner, and then another five foot step back at the corner of the northern building. And then similarly on the riverfront side, there's that 50 foot height limit. Um, they would be providing a two foot step back at the corner, a seven to eight foot step back for that entire length of the building wall, a 10 foot step back at the corner, 35 foot step backs at the top floor to allow for um, these sky decks, a five foot step backs to allow for a row of recessed balconies, six foot step backs at the corner and five foot step back at the corner, a 13 foot step back again at the top story, and then a five foot step back on the northern building. So even though they're not providing the full uniform 10 foot step back, they are providing step backs that will also help to minimize the perceived height of the building from the pedestrian view and give the building some articulation without necessarily providing the wedding cake design. Um, the Coastal Commission staff noted that the building would not be compatible with the surrounding development. Um, so I wanted to provide some photos of some of the surrounding buildings downtown, both existing and um, approved and soon to be constructed. This is the University Town Center. This is on Pacific Avenue, but it's um, across from the project site. This is 69 and a half feet tall. This is 1010 Pacific. This is directly across from the proposed project, and this is 66 and a half feet tall to the top of the sixth floor. And then here we have the Cooper House, which is 80 feet to the penthouse. And then this is the Palomar Building. This is 92 feet tall. The Pacific Front Laurel Project was recently approved, and um, it reaches a height of 85 feet. And then the Pacific Station project was also recently approved and that is an 80 foot tall building. The Coastal Commission staff also noted that the building impacts visual coastal resources. So this is the map from the LCP that identifies protected scenic view sheds. The project site is shown in red in that dashed line. Um, and it's directly in front of an area of the downtown that's um, identified as a protected urban skyline. There are two arrows on the Laurel Street Bridge that identify the views up and down the river as a protected scenic resource. And the project site is clearly peripheral to that view shed. It doesn't block or otherwise impact views of the river from the river or the bridge. The map doesn't identify distant mountain views from the river as a protected view shed, and the downtown view of the river is already blocked by the levee. So um, while this map is not easily um, easy to decipher, this is the resource in the LCP that we rely on to evaluate impact to public view sheds in the coastal zone, and the project site is clearly not impacting these view sheds. Um, the applicant provided these matching diagrams to respond to um, some blanket statements made by the Coastal Commission staff that an increase in height above 70 feet that's allowed in the additional height zone automatically results in coastal resource impacts, which they later implied to be visual. Um, so these matching studies show the development in the context of existing and recently approved um, surrounding development to show that it's of compatible size and mass 
um, and also show the differences between a building that's constructed to the allowed height versus um, the density bonus height of one story, one additional story. Um, so in this case, this is from the Soquel Bridge, and it shows the Pacific Front mixed use development alongside. Um, and so this uh, clearly shows that there is um, barely a decipherable difference in height between the two images. Um, in this um, diagram, again, the Pacific Front mixed use development and the Pacific Station redevelopment. Um, and then the Front Street project, also showing that there is not a large difference in the height. Um, this is again a similar image. And then a view of the project at 70 feet, and then with the additional story on the right, this is a view down Cathcart from Pacific Avenue. Um, and then this is a view down Front Street of the project site, and um, I, I can't tell the difference between these two buildings here. Um, and then finally, a view of the project site from the um, from the Trestle Bridge. Um, and then this is provided as another comparison of the proposed height showing impacts on the distant mountain views to the northwest. So um, this is the project as proposed with the additional story allowed in the density bonus, allowed with the density bonus. Um, this is the project without the additional story. So this is uh, the building built to the 70 foot height limit still blocking distant mountain views. And then this is the project with the additional story. So um, uh, we should also note that um, as previously discussed, this viewshed is not identified as a protected scenic viewshed on the LCP map, but in any case, there is no difference in the impact beyond. Um, so I just want to quickly go back to the Coastal Commission recommendations um, and note that the project meets the criteria in the downtown plan to be eligible for additional height in the additional height zone B as detailed in your staff report. The project includes a request for a density bonus under density bonus state law. They are eligible for variations in development standards and have requested incentive concessions and waivers as a part of the project. Um, we're not aware of any open-ended policies that allow for staff to ask for unlimited public benefits. Rather, when it comes to public benefit, the downtown plan specifically states that a project shall provide a clear demonstration of the public benefit relating to two principal objectives, high quality public access between Front Street and the river and the appropriate treatment of the river front edge along the river walk. And both of these public benefits are met with the proposed project. The Coastal Commission seems to take issue only with the additional height proposed with a density bonus and not the 70 feet allowed with the additional height zone. They have concluded that any height over 70 feet is an impact to coastal resources. However, these impacted coastal resources have um, not been identified and the LCP map does not identify this project site area as a protected scenic view shed. And then finally, it's um, also unclear why the Coastal Commission is concerned with this additional height, which is permitted with a density bonus request. Um, because in 2019, the Coastal Commission approved an LCP amendment that was intended to harmonize the Coastal Act and state density bonus law. The policy acknowledges that density bonus projects will vary from the LCP standards as long as there are no impacts to coastal resources. Um, and again, Coastal Commission staff has taken the position that any height over 70 feet is an impact without identifying what that specific impact is. This project provides more affordable housing than that which would be provided in a non-density bonus project. Um, we were able to confirm that a conforming project and a density bonus project result in similar view shed or visual impacts. Um, we have not been able to identify an impacted coastal resource, resource nor a regulatory path to require the developer to provide more affordable housing or other public benefits as requested by Coastal Commission staff. Um, and the project meets the inclusionary housing requirements and density bonus law is intended to allow for specific projects with, to allow for projects with specific percentages of increased affordable housing to vary from site development standards. And it doesn't grant local jurisdictions the authority to increase these percentages at will. Um, I'm gonna stop the slideshow there. Um, but um, also include that even in, the, in light of all of this analysis, the applicant 
is willing to voluntarily provide such additional public benefits in response to the Coastal Commission's comments. Um, so you should have received a copy of the draft finding and condition of, of approval that outlined these contributions. Um, I believe that uh, the clerk sent them to you during the course of this meeting. Um, I'm gonna have to unfortunately read them aloud for the record. Um, so feel free to read along or tune me out. <laughs> Um, the uh, draft finding would be added to the resolution and it would be included just before the therefore it shall be resolved section of the resolution and it would state in finding that approval of the project is fully consistent with the local coastal program the city has fully considered the issues raised by the coastal commission staff in the letters dated november 10th 2020 and december 30th 2020 and has concluded that no changes to the project or additional conditions of approval are necessary in order to satisfy the requirements of the lcp or the coastal act nevertheless it is recognized that the, coastal that the coastal permit is appealable to the Coastal Commission. And because of the positions taken by the, co by the commission staff, there can be no assurance that the Coastal Commission will not find a quote, unquote, substantial issue. If the project is subject to such an appeal hearing, the applicant has indicated that the council understands um, that result would be substantial cost and delay for the project that may endanger the ability of the project to proceed in a timely fashion or at all and improvements to riverfront access and and therefore may risk all substantial benefits of the project including but not limited to significant improvements to riverfront access and 20 affordable dwelling units including 15 units for very low-income families and five units for low-income families Therefore, in an effort to mitigate this risk, the applicant has voluntarily agreed to provide additional public, benef public benefits as enforceable conditions of approval. Said voluntary condition of approval is included in the attached exhibit A as condition number 69.1 under the prior to building permit final occupancy heading. Although the city finds that such additional conditions are not required to achieve consistency with the LCP, these additional conditions benefiting the riverfront area and affordable housing are consistent with the city and coastal act policies. In adopting these additional conditions, the council understands that one, in the event that the coastal permit is appealed and there is a finding of substantial issue, the coastal permit will be subject to de novo review. And as a, a result, these and all conditions of the coastal permit will become null and void unless imposed by the coastal commission. And further, two, as a result of any such appeal process, the applicant will incur substantial costs. And as a result, the applicant has indicated that they may oppose the reimposition of the above condition by the Coastal Commission. Because this new condition is not required for the coastal permit to be consistent with the LCP and is instead proposed in response to special circumstances, the imposition of these additional conditions shall not be considered to set any precedent for any future projects within the coastal zone. The new condition of approval for the permit would state, as an additional condition of approval for the coastal permit only, as voluntarily agreed to by the applicant, the project shall make the following payments prior to certificate prior to certificate of occupancy being issued unless otherwise specified. A pro rata contribution not to exceed $50,000 towards the city's upcoming preparation of a San Lorenzo River Management Maintenance and Enhancement Plan, including the associated studies and CEQA documentation that will address activation, public amenities, environmental habitat, restoration, and climate adaptations along the river. Um, second bullet, a contribution of $400,000 to the city's affordable housing trust fund. And the third bullet, if a funding offset for a portion of the Front Street signal improvement adjacent to the project can be secured, then a 50% matching amount of, so this, I'm sorry, I, I should start this third bullet saying that this language has been revised just a bit from what you're reading there. So let me start over on this third bullet. If a funding offset for a portion of the Front Street signal improvement adjacent to the project can be secured, then a 50% matching amount of the funding offset up to $100,000 will also be provided by the developer to the city's affordable housing trust fund, period. 
Um, and then the further language in the condition states, if the Coastal Commission finds substantial issue and considers an appeal, that appeal is a de novo proceeding. It, for the avoidance of any confusion, given that this is a voluntary contribution, in the event the Coastal Commission finds a substantial issue and asserts jurisdiction in the event of an appeal, then the city acknowledges that due to the de novo nature of the Coastal Commission's hearing, this condition will be null and void and the city understands that if it is proposed as part of the Coastal Commission approval, it could at the applicant's discretion be challenged by the applicant. Um, so in terms of the conditions of approval of this project, in addition to that one, the Historic Preservation Commission um, recommended partial preservation of the historic buildings that's already been addressed and is being proposed as a part of the project. Um, the Planning Commission also suggested conditions of approval um, that ensure that the murals are completed as a part of the project, and this condition has been added as condition number 32. Um, the Planning Commission also recommended a condition of approval to require that um, to require the applicant to provide inclusionary units in addition to affordable density bonus units. And we received advice from both our city attorney and Barbara Couts of uh, Goldfarb Libman, who uh, specializes in density bonus law, that case law has deemed such an action to be inconsistent with density bonus law. Um, uh, attorney Barbara Couts is here to answer any questions around that concern, um, but we're currently not recommending that as a condition of approval. Um, and then staff added condition of approval 33R that restricts rooftop mechanical equipment to a height of five feet above the maximum building height. Um, and we also added condition of approval 36 to require that the developer install fiber conduit during their sidewalk construction. So I'm, I'm almost done. <laughs> Um, you received all public correspondence for this project. There was a packet that was um, saved as a post packet production correspondence from the November 10th meeting, and that was mistakenly left out of the staff report, but it has been sent to you um, for review. So that was why some of the comments that you received noted that their comments weren't included as a part of the report. Um, one community concern that's been raised throughout the life of this project has been with regard to the relocation of the 418 project. That is a business that's currently located in a building that's proposed for demolition. I spoke with Laura Bishop of the 418 project in November and she indicated that she was interested in purchasing a place for a permanent home for the business, but that she was not able to come to an agreement with the developer for this site. Um, so while city staff have been encouraging the developer to work with this business, um, there are no regulations that allow for us to require them to lease to a specific tenant. Um, so I don't really have any further information on these communications between the developer and the 418 project, but um, the council can certainly ask the developer to respond um, if you'd like additional information. So finally, the staff recommendation to the city council is um, adoption of the resolution certifying the EIR, um, adoption of the resolution adopting, adopting findings of fact, mitigation monitor, the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, and a statement of overriding considerations, and adoption of the resolution approving the project with the design amendments proposed by the applicant to meet the recommendations of the HPC and PC, um, and based on the revised findings and revised conditions of approval. Um, and so we have the applicant's team here to answer any questions that you might have. We also have our CEQA consultant, Stephanie Strilo, and CEQA attorney, Sabrina Teller, here to answer any CEQA questions. Um, and then Barbara Couch is here to answer any density, um, density bonus questions you might have. And that concludes my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sam, I'm wondering if when we get into deliberation, uh, I'm going to open this up for council questions, but um, I'm wondering if when we get into deliberation, if we might be able to get um, that information that was read off. Um, I know we were emailed it, but I'm wondering if there's a way that maybe um, Bonnie Bush could maybe put that up, especially the language around, um, I think it was a, the additional condition or the let me look here, um, the new condition of approval of the local coastal permit, just because there was a lot to take in. And, you know, if we could maybe get that up, that would be great before we, we get close to the vote. Sure. Cool. Yeah, I can, I can put that, I can put that on a slide for you. Okay. Um, and I um, am happy to open this up for council questions and clarifications. And I want to check with 
the clerk or my previous mayors here. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and do questions and clarifications for, to staff. We'll then open it up to public comment and then we'll come back to the council for deliberation. And I'm seeing um, Mayor Cummings and Mayor Watkins both nodding, so it's good. You guys are booking uh, on my screen, so it's very helpful. If I could um, pop in really quick, Mayor. Um, I We usually offer time for the um, applicants as well. Yes, so we'll, yeah, do, uh, and Bonnie, do we usually do that um, uh, right before deliberations or what's the proper proper time um, we usually do it before public comment okay great so why don't we go ahead and get um questions and uh comments or clarification clarification or questions from um from uh council members for staff then we'll hear from the applicant who is here today and then we'll go into public comment and then we'll come back for deliberation so I will go ahead and look to see if there are any comments or questions from council members. Uh, council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks. Thank you for that presentation. Um, I had some questions uh, regarding the public benefit that was brought up in the, um, the letter from the Coastal Commission, because I think one of the things that they brought up was the affordable housing issue and um, and so, you know, I think that a lot of the laws that have come up, you know, density bonus, the increase in the height from 50 to 70 feet, measure O, are all initiatives that have been pushed to really try to increase affordable housing in the community. And um, and so I just had a few questions around, um, in particular, this combine this combining of the inclusionary units with the um, the density bonus affordable. Units and um, and kind of to that point that was brought up with the planning commission because um, I know we've received some correspondence, but it does seem like the city has some discretion around whether we can combine that or if we need to you know have the development meet the affordable the inclusionary requirement under Measure O and then in addition to that you know, meeting the um, requirement of affordable units under the density bonus law. And so I'm just wondering if maybe the city attorney or if someone can speak to that because. You know, I think that, you know, with 175 units being proposed with currently only 11% of those are gonna be affordable. And that's not even meeting the, the minimum 15% under the previous uh, inclusionary uh, ordinance that we have. And so I think we all wanna maximize affordable housing in our community. This is an opportunity for us to do so. So I'm wondering if we can see comments made on why um, we're required to combine the inclusionary requirements with the density bonus requirements. So we uh, based that on uh, a reported appellate court decision called Latinos Unidos versus uh, Town of Napa, in which the court essentially said that the city can't stack density bonus affordability requirements on top of our inclusionary requirements. Um, it, it's the case held that uh, the density bonus statute does not allow a city or county to use its inclusionary ordinance to increase the minimum number of affordable units over that called for by the statute in order to qualify a housing project for density bonus. Um, and I, I will uh, allow Barbara to weigh in here as well, but I just wanna point out that there's been an argument made that uh, the Latinos Unidos case doesn't apply here because measure O predated um, the, the density bonus uh, statute and and the reason why um, yeah, I mean if you think about all of the the zoning code changes that the city has made over the last two years to comply with changes in state law um, and and measure O is not a no no exemption from that um, when state law preempts the city from doing something it doesn't matter whether the ordinance was adopted before the state law went into effect or after it's, it's still subject to the state law. So we view that as a very clear uh, um, is, issue in terms of uh, the city's ability to ap apply density bonus on top of the inclusionary requirement. Uh, simply conflicts with state law and Barbara may wanna weigh in. Yeah, I, um, I completely agree with what the city attorney had said. 
Um, I think as was mentioned in the staff report, we were actually the uh, firm that represented Napa County. Napa County had also had a, uh, an inclusionary ordinance for many years. It had been adopted in 1993, a little bit later than your measure O, but still way before the density bonus ordinance uh, statute was adopted. It wasn't a new requirement, but they amended the uh, inclusionary ordinance in 2010 and at the time required that the density bonus uh, units be, be provided in addition to the inclusionary uh, units, exactly what your planning commission has recommended. And so this was challenged, that ordinance was challenged not by developers, but by Latinos Unidos, which was a group uh, representing lower income Latino residents and represented by a public interest law firm which you know may have had an impact on the court. And uh, basically they argued that there was a greater burden that the, the county's requirements would place a greater requirement on developers than was permitted by state law and would make it harder to develop projects at all. Uh, that was essentially the argument that they made to the court. Um, we brought up many of the same points raised by the Planning Commission uh, regarding the county's interpretation of state law it had been an, an issue of some disagreement that the county's policy as what your planning commission is recommending uh, resulted in more housing, that more affordable housing than what the plaintiffs were arguing. But the court held that the density bonus statute um, was very clear that any affordable units provided, whether they were provided by the inclusionary uh, ordinance or just provided voluntarily, uh, would qualify the project for a density bonus and that the units uh, could not be stacked. So the court was quite the, the court was quite clear. Really, we did our best on trying to make the Planning Commission's arguments, but the, the court just did not disagree. They looked a lot at the legislative history. There was actually conflicting history, but but at the end of the line, they uh, they accepted the plaintiff's argument. And as I said, I think because the lawsuit was brought by a an affordable housing group representing lower income residents, uh, that may have had an, an influence on the courts on the court's decision. Um, in terms of some of the issues raised by the planning commission. The, um, the public access policies in the city's coastal plan don't relate to housing, they relate to, they relate to rec, uh, recreation. And the Coastal Commission does not have, unfortunately, uh, the ability to require more affordable housing in the coastal zone. That was their mandate to protect and provide for affordable housing was removed in 1981. I'm not sure what the history was about that. And as the city attorney said, laws adopted by the people don't have any more rights, if you like, than laws adopted by uh, a board of supervisors or a city council. So um, as a consequence, uh, the city really is just not permitted to require that the inclusionary units be provided in, adi or in addition to the ones required to uh, achieve the density bonus, and I'd be happy to answer questions. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I did have one other question that was uh, not related to the density bonus, but was um, really just a, a question of process. So when we, when, as I was reading through the staff report, um, I, was, I noticed that the project first came um, the application first came on August 7th, 2018. Um, a community meeting was held in July of 2018. And then the application was complete uh, July of 2019. But the density bonus law, well, SB 330 didn't come into effect until, 20, until October of 2019 after this application had been submitted and accepted. And so just like out of curiosity, you know, the project went through this whole community process and now it, there's more units than was, than was initially proposed. So were there other subsequent community meetings or you know, how did we get to this point where um, it went through the process but now today before us we have you know 175 units rather than 133? Um, 
Yeah, that's a good question. I um, I will I can look up those dates for you. Um, there there was a point in the processing where they um, increased the units and added the density bonus to the project, and I um, don't recall off the top of my head where that fell in terms of the timing of the community process. But I will look up that date for you. Yeah. Any more questions, whoever coming? No, thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Clarification, um, uh, Mayor Myers, you said questions and comments, but I think we reserve our comments until after. Yeah, we hear. I meant, I meant uh, questions and clarification. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to. No worries. Um, I don't miss my opportunity for that. Yeah. I, I just wanted to follow up and uh, thank you for the um, your uh, your recommendations and your um, analysis of the density bonus rule vis-a-vis -vis the Coastal Act and the local coastal plan. I, um, and I think this may be an area where we will respectfully agree to disagree <laughs> in the end, but I did want to try to clarify just a little bit more following up on uh, Council Member Cummings' questions um, related to the role that the Coastal Commission plays. Um, the you know, the the Coastal Act does supersede the density bonus rules. So, and that has been acknowledged, I think, all around. And so, um, you know, th this is, uh, you know, something that has been contemplated by the Coastal Commission when uh, the LCP was amended, I believe in 2019. Um, and it was amended to recognize that the changes made within the coastal zone um, were, would be cons consistent with the density bonus law was to encourage the development of affordable housing. So I'm not sure how, what that, what that is with respect to the assertion that the Coastal Commission does not have the right to uh, weigh in on uh, afford housing, afford the number of units, uh, affordable units in a project. So to clarify that would be helpful. Yeah, the coastal, the, as I said, the, the, there used to be a mandate, I think it was called the Mellow Act, where the Coastal Commission did have the right to require affordable housing in, in the coastal zone. They have adopted an environmental justice component where they say they would like to encourage developers to provide more affordable housing, but it's not, um, but it does not appear that they can require development, you know, because of the removal of this authority, it does not appear they can require them to have affordable housing. Obviously, the Coastal Commission has many ways of applying its own pressure, but, but yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Council Member Watkins. Um, thank you for those clarifying um, comments and, and questions from my colleagues. My, my question is a little bit different, I think, um, off this topic and maybe would be most appropriate for our planning planning staff um, or potentially for the applicant later. But we've see, we received a number of correspondence in, re, in regards to um, the bike access and sort of the um, accessibility with this new development proposal. And I'm wondering if you could speak to that, um, kind of some of the concerns that were raised by the community. Yeah, we did receive um, a request um, from different members of the public regarding the need for a ramp, um, at least in one of the public pedestrian, um, the passageways. Um, and the applicant did evaluate the potential for a ramp in the Elm Street passageway. Um, it is a very large switchback ramp, um, whereas now they're providing sort of a more welcoming set of stairs with a bike rail that allows for people to um, uh, push their bike up the set of stairs, or if they have a, a, a larger contraption, they can utilize the elevator to get up to the um, river walk. Um, but we also reviewed the, um, we weighed the benefits of the bike ramp against the ability for somebody to um, use this um, 
bike rail and utilize the um, elevators or um, simply walk to the end of the block and get access to the river walk from those points which are flat and um, allow for easier bike access. So um, the downtown plan and the downtown plan EAR, they don't require a bike ramp per se, they do require bike access. Um, we felt that the um, bike rail was enough given the other points of entry that are in close proximity and the fact that they're adding the bike rail. Um, and we also preferred the design of the staircase um, uh, as a more welcoming pedestrian um, access point to the river. Um, but I know that that's still an area that some members of the public would like to see as a ramp. Any other council members with questions at this time? Um, Mayor Myers, I, um, I do have a response to um, council member Cummings' question. Um, so it looks like the plans changed to a density bonus project around June of 2019. So that would have been after the um, community meeting that we had for the project. Um, and um, although we did not have an additional community meeting, um, we did have other ways for the public to engage in the design process. We had the um, environmental, um, the environmental impact report scoping meeting, which was a public had many members of the public attend that meeting. Um, we had all of the project information on the website and we received numerous comments through that venue as well. Um, and we um, uh, posted the site with different um, uh, notifications to allow for people to communicate in that way. So um, that's correct. We did not have another community meeting after the density bonus was added to the project. Um, but we did have other areas for the public to engage. Any other questions before I um, invite the, um, the applicant to come up? Um, I just had one quick question myself. Um, can you remind me, I know it's in the staff report, but that's several hundred pages long. Um, the, um, the targeted um, income, I guess, adjusted um, median income uh, levels for the very low income and the low income, are, I believe the units are at 50% very low. That's very low, correct? So that's 50% AMI. And then the additional five units, I believe, are at, Low income, correct? That's okay. correct, 80%. And for anyone um, in the public who wonders what all those um, acronyms and percentages mean uh, and really wonder who can live here, <laughs> um, is there a salary range or a two-income two household kind of salary range that is, is identified for those units um, or uh, with regard to that 50% that AMI? Um, I'm just curious if that's available or we can pull that up at all quickly. Mayor Myers, this is Bonnie Lipscomb. Um, I, what we have, what, how we do it is we do a formula and then we um, establish what the maximum rents are. And okay. so for the 50% unit, it ranges for the units in the project between one person studios up to three person, two bedrooms. And so that range for the 50% unit is from $963 a month as the maximum rent that will be paid for those units for the one for the one person studios up to 1200, a little over 1200 for the uh, two bedroom units. And then for the 80% of area median income, um, that range is uh, for uh, a studio 17, a little over 1700 up to 2300 for the two bedroom. And that's the maximum rent? That's the maximum rent. Got it, okay, thank you. Just wanted to clarify. Okay, um, I will go ahead and invite up the applicant now. Um, and I believe that's Owen Lawler, but I'm not sure, Owen, if you have additional uh, members of your, of your team or your group that will be attending. I'm happy to make sure that you guys all have access as needed. Owen, are you, is it just you today? Well, no, we have other uh, other members of, it, of our team are available for questions. They won't be making a presentation, but um, um, 
Adam Alpine and uh, Ian Murphy from uh, BDP Architects is available, and Doug Ross, my partner, is available to ask, uh, answer questions around the construction technology. And and uh, so we're, we're here. But I just have some brief comments because, uh, um, you know, Samantha's presentation was so excellent. She really covered pretty much everything. I think that everything's been covered. So I just want to just thank staff uh, for all the hard work that's gone into this over five years to get to this point. It's hard to believe it's been five years, but it's taken five years to get to this point. And, um, and I want to really recognize Samantha through uh, a fire evacuation and a pandemic kept working uh, sometimes day and night to put this application together and get this to you. It's, it's, a tr tremendous amount of work to get to this point, and as, as you, you're just kind of getting the tip of the iceberg here. Um, and and I want to also thank um, that uh, coastal staff. We've we've been lately working with coastal staff, and we understand there are a lot of competing issues uh, in the community. And this is a big project and a new chapter in development in, in downtown Santa Cruz. And they, I know they have to comp a balance competing interests, but. But we, we've made these additional um, uh, contributions and attempts to, to, to make the point that we really want to find a path forward to get this done and start construction on this really important project in downtown Santa Cruz. Um, you know, we're here for the long run. We'll do what it takes, but but we want to get going sooner than later. Um, and I also I want to I, I want to just. Um, kind of put this project in context and a little history. And, and, and that five-year application process has really uh, started in a lot of ways back in the 50s when the levee that, was, that we couldn't have along the, the, the river was built and really broke the connection between the river and downtown. And what this project really helps to do is reconnect that connection, something that uh, I think really is widely shared in the community to reestablish a real strong connection to the river. And while the affordable and all of the housing is critically important, that reconnection to the river is really a community aspiration that's been, you know, uh, um, in, I think when, when people realized it was broken when the flood control project was built, uh, there was an immediate need in, by the 1960s to try to find a way to reconnect it. And, and, so it's been in the plan, the city's plan since at least 1977 to reestablish this connection. And this will be the first project that will actually begin that process. So I want to, I, I just want to bring that up. And I, I think it's really important to, to remember this is a, uh, it's the beginning of a, of a, a change. And as we come out of COVID, um, you know, reinvestment in downtown is going to become doubly important to support our downtown merchants and to find ways to revitalize downtown and bring more, even more activity downtown, to a place that we all love and we all know needs to be um, nurtured going forward. And we think this is an important, this project, the investment, the people living downtown are important ways to nurture downtown and bring it and make it uh, more vital. Um, and, you know, I'm here to answer questions. You know, I think Samantha covered a lot of stuff really well. But the main thing is, there's, you know, we've got the downtown plan, the, the uh, general plan 2030, the downtown first principles, the urban, the slurp, the housing blueprint, uh, two, uh, two year uh, work plan for the downtown strategic goals. All of these things reinforce that this project is really key to implementing so many things that, that we've discussed as a community for years and years and years. So. We're excited to move forward. Uh, our team is here to answer questions, and um, um, I, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Owen. Is there any council members that have questions for the applicant, for Owen? Going, going, gone. Let me make sure. Uh, yeah, Council Member Cummings and Council Member, uh, I'll go with Council Member Cummings first and then Council Member Brown. Um, yeah, thanks for, for the, um, those comments. <clears throat> I, I have some questions uh, regarding the affordable units, and I was just curious what kinds of units those would be, because um, I know that what's come up is you know, these are the units for like, you know, low income families. 
and so I'm just curious, like, what the mix of those units is, you know, plan to be, because I think one concern that people have is, okay, we're going to build these affordable units, are, you know, are they just going to build 20 studios, you know, are they going to actually be three bedrooms, like, what's the kind of proportion of the different units, and so I was just wondering if you could speak to that. Uh, as I understand it, the ordinance requires that the units be reflective of the mix of the project, and the project is studios, one bedrooms, and two bedrooms. So there's gonna be affordable studios, affordable one bedrooms, and affordable two bedrooms. Um, and 15, like 15 units is affordable to very low income, which um, are the hardest units to deliver for a whole variety of reasons. And that's what this project does. It's, it, you know, um, uh, so, so no, we're not gonna, I don't think we could, and we're not intending to make all the, pride, all the studios affordable. Bonnie, I see maybe could answer this question better than me. Yeah, and I would just confirm what Owen is saying. So when we enter into the affordable housing agreement with the developer, we have the, um, the affordable units reflect the overall makeup um, of the units in the project as far as breakdown of unit size. So that's why we give the range of the uh, for of one person to the two bedroom units. We'll have that uh, be represented in the affordable units. Okay, thanks. And then I had one other follow-up question because my understanding, based on some analyses that staff was able to do uh, last year, is that one way to meet some of these affordability requirements is to, to have Section Eight housing vouchers, which you know. Those units would be at market rate. So the person would have the voucher that the you know, government would subsidize the cost. And so, you know, I'm just kind of curious, and maybe city staff can also comment on this as well. But you know, I, I get the state density bonus law, um, and and I understand understanding that it's that what will come out of this will be 11 percent of the units will be affordable rather than at a minimum time meeting on 15, and knowing that's something that our community really wants to see is more affordable units. I'm just kind of curious if you can speak to, you know, the potential for having more affordable units under and utilizing that, especially because that helps with financing as well. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman, for coming to our question. So a couple of things on Section 8 is important. Uh, as you may know, state laws and changes, uh, you can no longer discriminate on, a, on someone who has a Section 8 voucher. So every unit we bring online in the community is a potential place that a Section 8 voucher holder can can live. We, I, I was on the Housing Authority Board of Directors for four years with um, Councilman Brenner. Um, one of the most um, horrifying aspects of that is that uh, people after waiting five, six years on a, on a, on a, on a wait list receive a voucher and then go out into the community and can't find a place to rent. And that's a direct result of not building enough housing in this community. And there's no other way around this than increase the supply of housing. And um, I'm glad that the state law has been changed to allow to, to, to make sure that uh, Section 8 vouchers cannot be discriminated against. We need to increase the supply. This is. Uh, I'm hopeful that the new Biden administration will follow through on its plan to increase the number of vouchers uh, nationwide, and we'll need to correspondingly increase the supply of housing to house people. And uh, thank you for the question. Uh, Councilmember Brown. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, Councilmember Cummings uh, got one of my questions, but I um, would, I, I also, have, I just have two questions. I'm just wondering if you could elaborate. Um, one, um, and I recognize that some of this has been elaborated upon in our, uh, you know, the city zone in the downtown recovery. And, and, um, but so, so one is, um, if you could just talk a little bit more about that reconnecting to the river and activating the river. Um, it, we use that terminology a lot, and I ha, I'm still a little bit at a loss as to what that means, given this is a uh, market, you know, primary market rate housing project and retail space, commercial space. Um, how is it that um, this is, an, you know, the people have access to the river now, and, uh, you know, it's not necessarily increasing access to the river. Um, it may increase the number of people who are 
you know, proximate to the river because of they live there or they might shop there or engage in commerce there. But other than, like, can you just explain, you know, give me a little bit more on what you mean by kind of reconnecting the river. I think it's a great point and I want to try to wrap my mind around it. Sure. And then just really quickly, the other question is on the, um, the revisions, the new conditions that have been uh, submitted for our consideration uh, on the, the uh, contribution to our affordable housing trust fund. I'm just wondering, uh, you know, a little bit more about how you came to that, uh, that figure. Uh, sure, thank you for the question. Um, connection to the river is something that many communities around the world are built on rivers. And traditionally, they, those connections uh, involve housing, commerce, uh, all aspects of, of, of community life. And um, when, we've all been to great cities around the world that have great urban river experiences. And yeah, technically it's true. People can now, I ride my bike on the bike levy all the time. We have a wonderful bike path that circles uh, you know, from the mouth to the to uh, Highway One, and it's a tremendous asset to the community. But what what really changes this dynamic is when people integrate the the, the river into their 24-hour lives. When people live, work, play, bring their families, and, re and on the river is when it really becomes alive. And that's the only way to do that is to bring activity there and create it along the river. And that's what you see in all these experiences around the world. And we have a chance here to really have a world-class experience um, on our river that connects our downtown and it really becomes a vital place, a meeting place and a place people want to hang out. We saw, we have a little um, vision of this uh, in Abbott Square where Abbott Square was a available before the recent re revitalization, but if most people who traveled by there before the revitalization, it was a pretty desolate place, even though it was technically open to the public. But now it's a vital place. It's a part of our community that people want seek out and want to be part of. And that and that's what we're trying to achieve here on the on the on the river, to extend that experience to a place where, where families and people in the community and visitors want to be and spend time and come back to time and time again. And that's what's so exciting about this project. And I think you had a second question. Sorry. Thank you. You know, I, I really was just wanting to hear, you know, your in terms of your vision of what that means, and, and that's really helpful. Uh, the other question was uh, related to the uh, new proposed conditions of approval, including uh, contribution to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And I'm just wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about how you came to in the in the conversation the the figure, the four hundred thousand uh, dollar contribution, and. Um, I think I, I think I understand on the signal enhancement, but the, just that that part of the, the that condition. Well, you know, it's it's a, it's a balancing act. We understand we want to help encourage additional housing downtown. As you know, there's other projects across the street from this project that will be coming forward. There are significant amounts of affordable housing, and we want to be helpful to create that housing and help make sure that that moves forward in a, a timely time frame. And but we want to balance that with the, the cost to the project because this is an extremely expensive project and, and frankly, it's a very skinny project to get built with all of the expensive in, uh, um, public improvements around the levy, the uh, open space uh, connection from the end of Cathcart Street and the other open spaces. It's, it's an expensive, expensive project. And so we balance, the number arrived at really balancing between uh, what you know, trying to find a way to be helpful, to uh, uh, facilitate even more affordable housing downtown, and not not burden the project to the point where it's unfeasible. Uh, Council Member Cummings, did you have another question? Then I'll go to Council Member Bruner. Oh, you forgot to lower your hand, Justin. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Bruner. I, I had a question. 
Oh, you did have a question. Okay. I just, I just was on mute. Um, I did. I'm just wondering. You know, we have these additional conditions of approval, um, and I'm just kind of thinking. You know, based on some of the letters that we received from the Coastal Commission, I'm wondering if there is a willingness to add an additional condition, which would be that six units. Um, we could designate those as Section 8 units in the building because um, while all the units are available for Section 8, I think that by designating certain ones to be specifically available for those Section 8 vouchers um, would at least get us to the 15% for the entire project. And, um, and I think it's really important, as, as we've all been mentioning, that, you know, trying to figure out ways that we can get affordable housing and make that work. And so... I'm just wondering if there'd be a willingness for us to be able to include that in the conditions of approval. Um, and I also wonder, I'm asking that as well because, um, you know, I, I, I'm wondering if this does go to the, um, you know, the Coastal Commission, you know, could this be a way of also um, just demonstrating that there's a willingness to work with our community and trying to, you know, maximize affordable housing? Well, I would say this. There's 175 units that are available as vouchers if this project is built. Um, and I, you know, I don't know a way to specifically designate, and I don't know that uh, of a way uh, to designate um, uh, anybody who owns this project, anybody who owns any new housing will have to, um, uh, can't, again, can't discriminate on the basis of someone holding Section 8 voucher. I, so I, you know, I, I guess I'd say I'm open to ideas about how this, you know, could, but I, I, I don't really have a, a thought about how to um, expand it beyond what's, what's um, really laid out in state law. Uh, so yeah. I, I'm wondering, if, is there anyone on city staff that might be able to comment? Because I know that our economic development department was helping us with our inclusionary ordinance, and part of that was, you know, increasing. Um, the inclusionary from 15 to 20 with designate, you know, using Section 8 as part of that offset. So, Bonnie, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, th thank you for that question. I was kind of thinking this through. I, I, I think the challenge is the timing of when this project was deemed complete and um, the housing ordinance that was in effect at that time. So I think any additional um, requirement or condition would have to be voluntary and agreed to by uh, by the developer. Um, as far as the existing units in the project, you know, I, it sounds like Owen's really open to having, you know, any number of those be open to Section 8 vouchers. And obviously by state law, they, they are already. But if you're asking for additional units on top of those that are conditioned in the project versus specifying that some of the inclusionary units are uh, set aside for Section 8. Can you clarify? I think it's additive, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I think if it was voluntarily uh, they wanted to, to do that, that would be up to the developer, but I don't think we could condition that. The Our 20% ordinance is, um, you know, is, is a 2020 uh, inclusionary, so it's, it's a little different. Yeah, and I, I get that, um, but I'm just, you know, trying to, um, you know, because within that ordinance, one of the, the ways we figured out how to make that work was, you know, designating units within buildings as Section 8. And so I'm just trying to get a sense of is there a way, like how would we be able to do that in a project? Because it sounds like there's an openness to, you know, having, you know, figuring out how we could make units, you know, Section 8 units so that we can increase the affordability in the project, the affordable units within the project. So I'm just wondering, you know, how, is there a way that we can make that happen? I think encouraging for if there's any vacancies of the non-inclusionary units to consider accepting vouchers, um, you know, for those units if they stay vacant over a certain period of time, I would think that the um, developer team would probably be open to that, but I don't know that that's something that we can require. My, I guess the thing is I'm not asking I'm not asking for it to be a requirement necessarily, but it's something that we can agree upon because, for example, that in looking through you know these conditions for approval, I imagine that you know um, contribution of four hundred thousand dollars to the city's affordable housing trust fund that's not something the city requires a developer to do, but it's, been, it's something that's been agreed upon, right? right? And so I guess that's what you know where I'm coming from is yeah. is there a way that you know to in, in the spirit of trying to increase the amount of affordable housing that we're getting out of projects, is there some way <clears throat> that we can have some kind of agreement that right. would? And I'm saying that could be, I hear what you're saying, and, 
then that could be accomplished through if there was a vacancy, you know, for longer than 30 days, the developer were open to accepting Section 8 vouchers on the non-inclusionary units. That could be one way. Okay. Leah, I saw you come on. I don't know if you have any comments on that as well. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Cummings. Um, I, I was debating whether or not to chime in here. I, I will just share my thoughts. Um, you know, I, I see two separate um, sort of questions here. Um, the current inclusionary ordinance that does not apply to this project takes a segment of the 20% inclusionary housing and says that that will be offered to um, Section 8 housing choice voucher holders. And I want to make that distinction because I'm hearing something different from you, Council Member Cummings, which is additional units that would be um, made available to um, housing choice voucher holders versus taking some percentage or uh, some amount of the inclusionary units and um, have giving them preference to Section 8 housing choice voucher holders. Um, and while the inclusionary ordinance that is in effect for this particular project, the prior inclusionary ordinance, does not set forth provisions related to that um, in my recollection, um, I do believe that the applicant could agree to give preference to Section 8 voucher holders for some of those units. Um, and so that, those were the thoughts um, that I had related to this. Um, I haven't uh, talked through those with, with Bonnie or with the applicant. Um, they would need to agree to that given that that would be um, separate from the uh, requirements. And, and look at this, we've got our uh, one of our <laughs> Legal advisors, Barbara Couch, looking like she may want to comment on that as well. Well, I, I was just saying from a practical standpoint, the house, the, uh, there's a maximum rent that can be paid for, for Section 8. I don't know what it is, Bonnie, perhaps you know. But if the units are, basically if the market rent is too high, then it doesn't, then it doesn't work. Is that, am I accurate? That's all I was gonna add. Yeah, I mean, the, it, it's fairly close right now, the Section uh -huh. 8 rents to the market rate rents. Um, but for, depending on which units we're talking about, um, yeah, we, we, would have to, we would have to look at that as well. So I wanted to make that distinction between um, the uh, inclusionary and uh, density bonus restricted units versus what I heard you asking about, Councilmember Cummings, which is additional units above and beyond that. And um, there may be a different willingness from the applicant to, um, uh, to pursue Section 8 housing choice vouchers as a priority for uh, those two separate components, but that would be something that you would need to ask them. And Council Member Bruner. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Uh, so I, I'm asking this question to the applicant, Owen Lawler. Uh, what, and I'm tagging on to Council Member Cummings' question in addition to the question I originally had. So I'll start with that. Uh, would it be feasible to, to designate six of the homes to be preference for Section 8 voucher holders, knowing that the whole, all units would be available to Section 8 voucher holders should they be eligible, but to give preference, to designate six units as preference? I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I think Bonnie maybe was on to something in, in that when units were vacant, maybe there's a, for a certain number of time. Um, I think it's incumbent on any owner, uh, if there's a qualified 
person with a Section 8 voucher and the rents are nearly identical, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think it'd be an issue. I, you know, again, state law is clear. You can't discriminate on a on an applicant because they they have a section mm -hmm. now because they have a Section 8 voucher. So, mm -hmm. I, I don't know if it uh, makes sense to designate. I mean, one way to look at it, if you said, well, we designate six units. Does that mean the rest of the units are not eligible for Section 8, or, or I mean, we, would we be eliminating that somehow um, for for the other units? I, I just I I never really thought about the question that way, so I don't really have a good answer. Yeah, and I, I and I wonder. Um, I don't see it as you know excluding the other units from being eligible as well. And I'm not sure if this has been done in other, you know, developments. Uh, but and and what that length of time would be, you know, versus it being vacant or in holding out, essentially saving it for someone who was available with a Section 8 voucher. Um, so I I think we could look more into that. My uh, second question uh, was, you know, there have been a lot of letters and emails sent in that we've had a chance to go through. And um, one of the, the questions I have is on um, bicycle access, and it was brought up uh, to have a rideable access um, to the river between, I, I believe it was SoCal Avenue and Laurel Street. Uh, currently, there are several access points that are kind of those ramp uh, ways up to the river from Front Street. And um, I know in the plans there was, and, and Sam mentioned, the uh, kind of bike guide up along next to the stairs, but you can't really ride that uh, up. Um, is Are there options or is there a plan for rideable access um, somewhere in that? Well, uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So, so we looked early on at, at a at bike ramp that would be rideable, and the, because of the the 12-foot elevation difference between the top of the levee and Front Street, um, a bike ramp would would essentially take over the entire um, space with ramp. And and I think even we did some drawings, and somewhere in the package Samantha has them. What it would look like if we did were to construct that, and the problem is, is that you would take over the whole space as a bike ramp. I'm a bike rider. I ride every day. Um, the, there's a great access to the bike path at Soquel, and I, I had it. In fact, I had a discussion today with Gina Cole, Santa Cruz County Bank, Bank, and we, you know, we talked about this point. And, and yeah, they would like to see that, but they also understand the, the drawbacks of that. And we looked at it. We, we went for a bike ride together. And we looked at that. We think. Um, there's an opportunity to improve the access from Soquel Avenue bike bike lane that, that um, uh, we think there's a better opportunity to, to do some, a ramp from that bike lane potentially as part of, um, uh, you know, connecting the levee better at, uh, to uh, a better place to ride is on Soquel or, or on uh, the Laurel Street to connect to the levee, then try to give over the space to a big bike ramp to make it rideable because I think it would make detract from it being attractive to, to, to uh, pedestrians and people sitting if it was all taken over as a bike ramp. So, it, 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 you know, it's, it, that, that's, um, anyway, we looked at that. I think that's probably the best way to, to, to address that. <laughs> Let's see Martine's daughter. Um, any other questions? Oh. Thank you. Oh, let me. I just want to add one more thing while I'm thinking about it, because we haven't mentioned the 418 project, and it's come up in the past. We've tried 
Uh, I wanted to say I, I, um, we've tr worked hard to try to find a way for them to be in the project after the two or three year construction period. Um, and um, as of now, I, I, I'm not sure that we, we're going to find a way uh, that works for them. Uh, but we're, we're, we'll continue as we get closer to actually potentially building this project to look, see if we can, we can, we can be help in that process. I know uh, uh, COVID has been extremely difficult on dance troops and uh, all kinds of gathering activities and indoor gathering activities. So, so anyway, I just wanted to mention that, 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 uh, that we had been in discussions with them. So. Um, I had um, Council Member Watkins up next and then Council Member Brown. I think my question is maybe more for um, Mr. Kundati or uh, somebody from a, a economic development, but we've talked in the past about sort of the preference um, option. I know we've talked about wanting to have like local preference or other types of preference and kind of came up against um, what then is discriminatory. And so I just wanted to hear your thoughts about kind of the, the direction of going of, of sort of a preference. Like you, mean for, you mean for Section 8? Yeah, for Section 8. Uh, I, I think I would prefer to defer to Barbara on that because she, she is more of an expert on uh, those types of issues than, than I am. I, let's see, <laughs> the issue with fair housing laws is whether if you give a preference to somebody, um, it prefer, you know, there's a discriminatory impact. You know, does it preference people from one uh, ethnicity or race, whatever. Um, I have not heard objections to preferences for Section 8. I'm trying to think what the issues, what the issues might be. I guess if South Section 8 voucher holders were tended to be concentrated in one ethnic group, possibly somebody, you know, could could make a could make a claim that that it violates um, that it violates fair housing law. But there's no specific requirement. Uh, there's no sp specific prohibition against a preference for that reason. And I have a question with Council Member Brown. Yeah, I guess this is just a follow up to the earlier questions around uh, the Section 8 uh, preferences and, um, and Barbara, thank you for weighing in on that. Um, not hearing that there, there is any specific uh, uh, prohibition on that. Uh, you know, I'm I'm really interested in in this avenue, or you know, potentially going trying to move uh, in this direction, um, because I think we, you know we are are all uh, very much interested in getting maximizing the number of affordable units, um, either through the inclusionary um, requirement for the for rents or um, in Section Eight uh, housing choice vouchers, and so I guess I'm wondering, and it sounded. Uh, Mr. Lawler, like you were uh, su suggesting that you haven't um, really thought about it and you weren't sure how that might be accomplished. Um, and so what I'm just trying to think about is, is there a mechanism um, that maybe we could, like, is there a possibility for uh, trying to negotiate or that or discuss that with our um, our city staff to, to try to make that work? Because, um, and, and I appreciate your commitment to, uh, you know, uh, Section 8 voucher, you know, having, uh, uh, making sure that there's no discrimination uh, against uh, Section 8 voucher holders. Um, and that is the law. However, we know that um, it's not always the case and it's very hard to prove uh, discrimination. And given the high demand for housing and the limited number of units we have, um, it's, it makes it all the harder. So, um, you know, having that set aside, uh, I think would, uh, provide some, uh, you know, not assurance, but uh, certainly some uh, a higher level of comfort that this, this project actually could uh, provide additional affordable housing beyond the supply um, 
and I will say, as I always do, that you know, it, I don't believe that uh, supply and demand uh, is really that those arguments really hold in a community like Santa Cruz, where I don't think we can build our way out of our affordable housing crisis. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering um, if there's a, so the question your question seemed to be more about could, is there a mechanism that could be uh, uh, utilized and um, and so I just wanted to kind of gauge your willingness there you know I mean I, I'll just say in my uh, a very unscientific small and uh, sample a survey of Section 8 voucher holders in the the you know, outreach in the community that I've done, um, every, every Section 8 voucher holder who is currently housed in a rental unit in the city that I have spoken with has expressed uh, worry about um, their, uh, you know, their ability to stay in that, those units. They don't, you know, for example, when they ask for repairs or, you know, all these kind of different, you know, landlords can't discriminate, but they can tell their tenants, well, you know, that's just a little too much. And, you know, I don't have to rent. I, I'm not required to rent to Section 8 voucher holders if there is somebody else. Who you know who can rent the the unit? So I'm just I'm just trying to get at that that challenge of actually achieving the non discrimination goal, um, knowing that it happens. And again, not suggesting that that would happen in this particular project, um, but you know we don't know who's going to be making those ultimate decisions. You know, it's, it, I, I imagine it's not going to be you <laughs> deciding which tenants <laughs> occupy the building um, on, a, on a you know consistent basis. So again, just trying to find a way to uh, recognize that commitment that we have and the, and the real you know significant need that we have for uh, affordable units. Um, just wondering if you might having not considered it before and not being sure how it might work, if you would be open to uh, looking at that in conversation with our economic development staff, for example. Well, I would say, I, I would say again, I, I think that uh, we may see this differently. I think this constrained supply has worked very much against Section 8 voucher holders. And that if we don't have more supply, First of all, people with new vouchers won't get into units, and um, and and landlords don't want to invest, don't need to invest in their properties. I just say I don't have an answer. Voucher, you know, I want as many people to get a voucher as possible, and as many units to be available to those voucher holders as possible. And we'll comply with state law. And, and I mean, it, it, it is. I mean, up until the passage of that law, it was completely acceptable that you could simply say, I'm not renting to you because you have a Section 8 voucher. So that, those law, that's gone. You can't say that anymore. And, and sure, uh, I, don't, I think um, if, if people are good quality tenants, whether they're a Section 8 voucher or not, landlords will want to keep them in their units. And, and um, and so that's, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I'll just say also just as a, uh, what I've heard, for instance, on the new units that have come downtown during, during 2020 that have come online, a lot of those people have moved out of other housing in Santa Cruz to move downtown. So those are those units that people move out of that maybe are older, and I'm sure these are people with resources who can move into to expensive new units, and I'm well aware of that, that these are only people who are, have big incomes, but they're moving out of other properties that aren't so nice. And so those properties become available in the market. And so when you have a healthy housing market, you've got a lot of supply and about people, the best way I think to house people ultimately, or most people is gonna be through uh, more Section 8 vouchers being available. So that's, that's, that's what I, and, and then more units available when they get their voucher so that they have options to find a place to live. Other questions from council? Okay, I will go. Um, thank you, Owen, for really answering all those questions and taking the time to work through what I think are some interesting ideas. Um, uh, and uh, we'll go ahead and open it up to public comment now. Um, I see, uh, I'll check with the clerk. Um, I see, 
Uh, phone number ending in 3660 is our first public comment. And you have two minutes. Can you hear us? Go ahead, please. I'm, hi, I'm Mark McCity Miller, a professional civil engineer and a former two-term planning commissioner. During my time on the planning commission, the commission updated the downtown plan, which was subsequently adopted by the city council. The riverfront project before you today is exactly the type of project the downtown plan envisioned. A new mixed use commercial residential project that will infill the dead space between the levee and the building, transforming that area into a park along the banks of the beautiful San Leandro River. A project that will provide not one, but two pedestrian promenades connecting our downtown to the river and fulfilling a long time community desire to more intimately connect downtown to the natural beauty of the river. A project that offers 175 new housing units to our city, a city with an acute shortage of housing. A project that offers 20 units of deed restricted, permanently affordable housing, 15 of which will be occupied by residents earning only 50% of the area median income, meaning rents will be between $963 and $1,200 per month. A project that by virtue of its location in the heart of one of our region's major employment centers in our very walkable downtown, across the street from a public transit hub and across from the future home of the farmer's market will dramatically reduce vehicle miles traveled, greenhouse gas emissions, and the number of car trips making our streets safer for everyone. Please approve this project and move Santa Cruz towards a more equitable, more sustainable, and more prosperous future. Thank you. Thank you. And the next caller will be with the phone number ending in 5542. You should be able to begin. Uh, good afternoon, Merry New Year, Mayor and Council Members. The proposed development on Front Street does more harm than good for overall housing affordability by driving up the area median income as market rate housing will bring in higher income tenants. How much are these new units gonna rent for? Why in heaven's name would the courts allow less affordable housing in a development when the intent of the density bonus law is to assure more affordable housing? Adding measurable requirements to the density bonus units appears perfectly logical and appropriate. Please give the city attorney the go ahead to bring this case to a higher court. The money spent will be well worth the cost to get additional affordable housing. Another concern about staff's recommendation to approve this development is it still abrogates the California Coastal Act and the city's own local coastal plan. I would recommend delaying the project hearing and approval for at least another few weeks. So it can be considered again by the city and the Coastal Commission. I think such an approach would bring the project significantly closer to the requirements of the Coastal Act and LCP and greatly enhance public benefits of public access and coastal resource protection. Please expand the public benefits by using the tax advantages created by the opportunity zones that were created in this area under the 2017 federal tax law. This means this project will reap millions of dollars in benefits to its investors. Opportunity zones provide wealthy investors a means to shelter recent and future capital gains. Given the tax savings this project will offer investors, we suggest the tax savings be applied at the front end by increasing affordable units. Why should the city of Santa Cruz allow a tax, tax haven to be built as staff has proposed rather than achieve a project for sustainably more public, substantially more public benefit? I recommend expanding public access requiring additional approval to fund public and, and park spaces. Thank you for your time and thoughtful consideration. Thank you. The next caller I've got is the number ending in 7100. 
You can go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, council members and mayor. My name is uh, Jesse Bristow from Swanson Builders. I was just uh, calling to speak in favor of this project and would like to commend uh, planning staff, the applicant, and Coastal Commission all working together to move this project forward. It's been uh, a long process, and we um, also have a project further north that ties into the riverfront uh, activation and we're happy to see this project move forward. The um, city of Santa Cruz certainly needs more housing, especially after all the fires and um, as Owen mentioned earlier, it's very hard to bring uh, very low and low income housing units online and this project is an example of that. And just for future reference, uh, you know, for people who call in and I guess any confusion regarding density bonus law, there is some material uh, from Myers Nave that helped kind of educate people uh, regarding how those matrices ma matrices work. And um, just additionally, a point this year, AB 2345 move forward and it changes the density bonus from those increases up to 35% to 50%. So we just like to highlight that, you know, projects moving forward, such as 190 West Cliff, such as this project, um, the density bonus is being utilized and, and it's uh, providing more uh, lower income units, more affordable units for the market. And so we're excited to see this move forward and see the, the levy and riverfront activation plan come to fruition. And uh, we, we ask that you approve this project. Thank you. Thank you. The next caller has a phone number ending in 7496. Oh, I'm sorry, 3349. Hello. Hello, I'm Donna Murphy, a resident of Santa Cruz, and with COPA colleagues and working to support projects that provide more housing in our county. I ask you to approve the Riverfront project. You have, you've begun to hear, and I think you'll hear more from some of my colleagues from COPA, about how important it is to have housing that is near jobs, transit, and services. In addition to the very low income affordable units in this project, it also adds a variety of housing types to meet different lifestyle and demographic needs. Another appealing part of this project is that it provides housing and community amenities along the San Lorenzo River, creating a walkable and bike-friendly access to both downtown and the river. Speeding development of housing in the heart of downtown should be a community priority, and I encourage you and urge you to support this project and move it forward. Thank you. Thank you. And the next caller, I believe, is ending in numbers. Uh, your phone number ends in 7496, please. And we can go ahead. Uh, good, af good afternoon, Mayor. Myers and council members. Uh, my name is Matt Farrell and I'm the vice chair of the downtown commission. And I'm speaking this afternoon on behalf of myself, not uh, on behalf of the commission as a advisory body. Um, I wanna urge you to approve this project. I think uh, the pedestrian connections that are identified and this uh, project proposal realize some long sought um, access to the river that was identified in the original San Lorenzo River design plan, which was developed in the 1970s. Secondly, I think that um, Developing affordable housing close to the um, Metro Center is a great um, exercise in equity. And um, I think that it will also create great opportunities um, to improve 
the mix of downtown residents in terms of their different income levels. Thank you for your time and uh, your hard work. The next caller uh, is identified as Mr. Kelly, so you're ready to go. Hey everybody, this is Kyle Kelly. I uh, just wanted to call in support of this project. Um, I also wanted to point out something for, for Section 8 uh, that I, I don't know if people are aware. So when the, when the state law passed um, this past year, I actually tried to identify some of the, the current people that had Craigslist listings um, that wouldn't allow for, for Section 8 vouchers, and it was actually really hard to enforce against them um, to try to report on it. An individual actually has to do it. Um, and, and if I contrast this to some of the people that I know that are at the Water Street Project who were formerly at um, 555 Pacific, was that a well-run development was much more likely to accept Section 8 vouchers, know what to do, and use it as guaranteed income and the mom and pop landlords were largely the ones that were being extremely discriminatory and finding kind of tricks and ways to get around it. So personally for me, I, I really like that these kinds of projects are going on um, because a lot of the kind of corruption that is kind of throughout the city happens a lot less with these ones, especially when it's a, a local developer that, that's doing it. This is my perspective and what I've seen within it. I'm, I'm hopeful that we can do a lot more. There's a lot of people that could really use this, right, that, that right now uh, get on a list or trying to find a place. Or in the case of the fires, we lost more than 900 market rate homes and people need to find homes. People need to find places to live. I mean, I, I, I used to live up in the Santa Cruz mountains myself and and I want homes for, for family and friends. This is really important to me. And, and so I'm, I'm really hoping that you can find, find a way to approve projects like this, help them go through, and especially when this provides other bike benefits and other infill development that can help, help lead us away from our, our dependence on cars. So thank you. Thank you. And the last caller that I've got down for today is ending in 1204. Go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, uh, City Council. My name is Jorge Savala. I'm a COPA leader with Shanika's Community Health and Holy Cross. And uh, since the pandemic broke out, I've been managing the Holy Cross Food Pantry. Um, prior to the pandemic, we were serving about 40 people a month, and now we're serving over 1,200 uh, consistently um, in the last four months. And so I have seen the exasperated need for affordable housing here uh, through the stories that they've shared. Um, many of our leaders here watching this call have participated in house meetings where we've heard many stories about the need for affordable housing and the construction for additional housing. We have teachers, probation officers, um, social workers and others that can't afford to live here and serve the community that they love. And so we are in support of this project and future um, developments with the inclusion of more affordable housing. And thank you for your time. We look forward to meeting with each and every one of you in the near future. Have a great time. Have a great day and happy new year. Take care. Uh, thank you um, to the callers or to the public commenters. Uh, I do want to mention and just make sure I haven't missed anybody. We do have Spanish translation available um, today. I don't know if any other callers would want or, or need that um, that service, but we, we can do that if there's additional people who would want to comment. Um, uh, if you're a Spanish speaker, we'd be happy to accommodate you today. Um, Mayor, I think um, if Peter can hop on and kind of make that announcement in case they our Spanish speakers? Yep. Sure. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Hello? Can, can you hear me? Good. 
Uh, buenas tardes eh, para los hispanos y los latinoamericanos que nos están escuchando, los que están hablando español. Eh, la alcaldesa Dana Merz quería avisarle a la gente que, pues, como me están escuchando, eh, tenemos, pues, yo les puedo interpretar. O sea, que si tienen comentarios sobre esta, agenda, esta parte de esta agenda o la anterior o durante el día, ya que sepan que hay alguien que habla español, los puede escuchar. Y si necesitan ayuda, pues, aquí estamos a, a la disposición. Gracias. And Peter, I'm just wondering, um, not being a Spanish speaker, uh, were you able to read off the directions in terms of it does look like um, someone has uh, called in. So you were able to to, uh, to read off the information regarding how to call in and, and et cetera? No, I did not translate that part. Okay. Let me look uh, it up right now. Yeah, let me, let me see if we can get this one caller in, um, Peter. Um, So, Peter, the number the number is ending in one five zero three. Can you announce that? Oh, so again, the number is ending in what? One five zero three for this speaker. Si el nombre el número que termina en uno cinco cero tres podría puede hablar. And they can they can begin speaking, Peter. Y puedes empezar a hablar desde ahorita. Ahora, el que 1503, el, que el, el número que termina en 1503, puede empezar a hablar ahorita. Thank you, Mayor Myers and um, Vice Mayor Bruner and City Council. This is Casey Byer from the Santa Cruz County Chamber of Commerce. I want to um, give a shout out to your city staff for their due diligence on working through all the nuances of this uh, very complicated project. Uh, it is, uh, it is uh, a godsend to see an opportunity to bring Uh, a project with housing mixed use and to open up the downtown to the San Lorenzo River. Uh, that has been a goal of the Santa Cruz County Chamber since the 1900s, when early on chamber leaders led, uh, a, led a public hearing event to uh, ask the city and the public leaders to, to communicate and open up their businesses and point them towards the river instead of back, putting their backs to the river. It was unanimously supported by the city council and the city leaders at that time. Here we are uh, over 100 years later and we're still looking at an opportunity to bring the river to the downtown. This project is the keynote to that opportunity. And there are other uh, projects that are in the pipeline that can follow suit. There's been a lot of conversation between the city staff, the, uh, the project uh, developer, and uh, the city council in regards to housing. Housing is the number one priority of the Santa Cruz County Chamber. Without uh, a strong, vital uh, economy and people to live near work, uh, we cannot make it through the pandemic and into the next uh, millennium. The opportunity here is in front of you. I would think this would be the greatest opportunity to create a vital downtown. I will leave you with one comment. Um, there are a lot of people that have suffered greatly, and it was mentioned about the, the firestorms that have displaced, you know, 920. 25 uh, homeowners that are now looking and searching for home. That has exasperated the rent in, in Santa Cruz County. Many of them have now relocated because they can't afford a place in downtown, they can't afford a place in the county at all. So I think it, there's an opportunity to find housing for all the people that want to live in Santa Cruz, especially in downtown. Thank you for your time. Okay. I am not seeing any additional folks trying to reach out. Um, so I will go ahead and um, close the public comment at this time. Um, and if, if we don't mind, uh, if council doesn't mind, I think if we take about a, about a five to six minute break, um, just, to, just to stretch for a minute, get a glass of water or a cup of coffee and we'll reconvene um, at uh, 4.40. So thank you.
Okay, we'll go ahead and get restarted. Um, I'm gonna reopen our public comment. I'm gonna go, I did miss a raised hand, so I'm gonna go ahead and reopen the public comment to get this last comment and then we'll bring it back to council for further deliberation. Uh, so I am looking at uh, phone number ending in 1884, please. Go ahead. Si está escuchando el número 1884, el que termina en 1884 puede hablar, por favor. Looking at number 1884. Número que termina en 1884, puede hablar, por favor. Okay, they're ready, Peter. Usted Go puede ahead. hablar, hable, hable, hable. Lo estamos escuchando. Hello, hable, hable. Uh, Mayor Myers, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, perhaps the direction about how to unmute with the star six would be helpful. I don't know. If I did that, I thought. Sarah already yeah, he unmuted. Yeah, okay. they just they muted themselves again. Bonnie, can you unmute them again? If the caller. Bonnie, are you able to unmute them? I, I'm not. I can ask them to unmute. Peter, can you tell them to press star oh, they're, six? They're good. They're unmuted. Go ahead and speak. Usted puede hablar Thanks ahorita so en el cuando. Ahora puede hablar. Are you there? I'm not hearing them, Bonnie. You know, I'm them. Yeah, I, I heard them talk. They're talking. Okay. Thank you. This is Gina Cole from Bike Santa Cruz County. Go ahead, Gina. Um, hi, thank you so much. Um, just a, a few comments about um, bike access. Um, Mr. Lawler and I have had multiple conversations in a bike ride. Um, and while we do understand um, the confines and the constraints of the um, of the stairwell and the access for pedestrians with the bike rail. I really just want to reiterate that a bike rail doesn't work for everyone. Um, folks that have a heavy bike, like an e-bike, would not be able to push their bike up a bike rail nor bring it down a bike rail. Um, folks with kids or with a cargo bike or with a recumbent bike, that's not an um, acceptable access point um, for them. Um, I am I'm happy to hear that um, that there will probably not be street parking on Front Street in front of the proposed buildings. That um, takes a little bit of pressure off of cyclists if we can maintain a straight line um, uh, of travel on that side of the road in in front of the, the new proposed building. Um, I would also like to recommend that the bike um, the bike lane is extended around the corner onto SoCal and that potentially we could have a, a way to access the, um, the, the levee at, that, at the bridge where there is a already access point, except that, that a hard right-hand turn, a 90 degree onto that um, sidewalk and then onto the, the levee trail would be nearly impossible to stay on your bike. So if there's a potential to have kind of like an on-ramp or a, a curb cut that would allow for that, that would be great. We would also recommend that leading from the levee trail to SoCal that there's some kind of treatment that would assist bikes in crossing SoCal. Thanks for the time. Thanks for taking my call. Thank you. Peter, we now have uh, a caller with the number 2174, if you could announce that and see if it, they need translation. El número, el número que termina en el 2174 puede hablar también ahorita, si me, nos está escuchando, el número que termina en 2174. 
Gracias. Um, my name is Gillian Greenside, and um, I and many others participated in the Downtown Recovery Plan, and we gave a consistent message that this proposed building was too big, too tall. Uh, totally understand the need for affordable housing. We don't have a need for housing in Santa Cruz. We have a need for affordable housing. There are still trying to lease units in 555 Pacific. Well, 20 units may be better than none. It is a very tiny percentage. That means 150 units at market rate, which obviously bumps up the area medium income. So in the long run, this makes it less affordable in our town. I disagree that that extra story does not impact views. As I looked at your visuals, uh, especially from Laurel Street, um, it, it is very uh, impactful, the extra story. Um, I don't, there's a lot of jargon about bringing the river to downtown, et cetera, et cetera. I and many others don't see how this massive building does that. Basically, it blocks the river from Front Street from other areas. But basically, this alters the character of Santa Cruz dramatically. I happen to be one who loves the little um, uh, the units where University Copy, etc. those buildings, those small buildings, are the heart and soul of Santa Cruz. And this will turn it into generic um, USA. We're very sad to see this. I think there are other ways to get 20 affordable units. And finally, I just say, I don't see why it's a legal question that you could require a condition that the extra units be for Section 8 housing. The council has that authority to make that a condition of approval. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, it looks like our last caller is ending in number 5362. El número que termina en 5364 puede hablar ahorita. Gracias. And if you could, we are ready to hear you. If you can unmute yourself. Si se quiere eh, quitar su mute, apretando eh, estrella 6 en su teléfono para que se pueda escuchar, que ahorita no se le está escuchando. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Go ahead. Uh, good, e good evening, Council. Um, this is Judy Grunstra. Um, I am not opposed to this uh, project, but I think it does need tweaking. I think you shouldn't downplay the Coastal Commission's concerns. Uh, the public benefit, um, one of those um, things that I am concerned with is the uh, 418 project. It seems to be an unresolved issue, and a lot of people in the community are concerned that we will lose that arts uh, opportunity. Um, so I'd like you to even write in something in the agreement with the developer that there will be provision for an arts organization in this building, uh, which will very much contribute to the vitality of our city. So, um, you know, we need your support to supp show that you really support the arts by, uh, you know, guaranteeing that there'll be some provision in this project for an arts organization such as 418 project. Um, and um, I didn't know if there's solar guaranteed in this project or not. Um, also, uh, the public benefit, I had seemed to recall that there was some sort of an amphitheater discussed along the river uh, walk. I didn't, didn't see that in this particular presentation. Um, and lastly, it does matter what our buildings look like. The height increase is uh, will set a precedent for future oversized projects. We know the city is changing, uh, but so far all the buildings that are being built are look alike, very unimaginative, uh, unimaginative projects. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Okay, I'll uh, return it back to council, and I have uh, council member Watkins. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Sorry, my dog was just barking. Let me call my tour really quick. I apologize for that. Um, I just want to thank, um, I want to thank the staff and uh, the Coastal Commission. It's really heartening to know that there's been, you know, just working meetings that are proactively trying to find reconciliation to move things along. Um, I want to thank those that also uh, called in and just the work that went in to try to get to the concessions to move forward. I. Um, 
I also really appreciate the added benefits, and I know that we were hoping to have those put up at some point. So, um, you know, I would like to see those uh, at some point visually for us as well for consideration. And um, I have a few few comments, and then I'm I'm prepared to make a motion to keep the conversation um, and the policy direction going. Um, having been on the council in 2017 when we approved the downtown plan, it really was about uh, listening to our community, really wanting to have more of our um, density in the downtown to really think about integrating our transportation and our business and our downtown in a way that. Um, uh, you know, the, a healthy downtown for all. And a big part of that was also really thinking about how are we as a community really thinking about our incredible natural resource, which is our river. And this really is that first step in connecting the downtown to our river and really does provide this sort of new, um, new access and new um, activation uh, of the river. So I, it's really exciting um, to get to this place. I also, at the time, really talked about in 2017 when we when we did do this about the need for childcare, and I don't necessarily have that in my direction, but I do want to just really state that for my colleagues and for the community, and that um, it is essential if we're thinking about bringing our uh, families and we're thinking about our workforce and we're thinking about not having people drive across town for childcare that we really think about how we're. Um, kind of integrating that critical infrastructure into our um, planning processes. Although it may not apply for this project, I do wanna just sort of state that. I also think that uh, 418 is a great asset, so however our economic development uh, department can continue to work with them to help them secure a location, I am definitely um, supportive and encouraging of that, as well as the bike um, access and modifications for an integrated system of transportation. Um, so I think just with that said, I, I feel that we have gotten to a place where um, I think this project can really move forward. And I also feel that even um, with the, you know, with, what I heard from the developer is really an interest in wanting to have additional Section 8 housing. And so I don't know if there could just be an informal type of recommendation um, as part of sort of just the, the council consensus. But um, at this point, I feel we've gotten to a place where we have a project that's really been able to reconcile some of the concerns of the Coastal Commission um, and after five years is, is ready to move forward. So that said, I will go ahead and make a motion to um, move the recommendation as proposed, as well as the, what just sort of flashed up um, additional um, community benefits that have been also added to, uh, to the recommendation. So my motion is um, as outlined in our staff report with the additional uh, community benefits outlined uh, through our staff as well. And I will, I will go ahead and second that. Uh, so can I ask for clarification really quick? Yes. I assume that the motion would incorporate the uh, revised additional finding uh, and, and the additional condition language that, um, that Sam uh, read off at the end of her presentation. Yeah, it was, Tony, we had, a, we had a visual on it for a few seconds and then it just, it was taken down. But yeah, I believe Sorry, that. Sorry, if Samantha wants to put it up, I had it up, but I can't type the minutes at the same time, so. Council Member Watkins, was that your intent? That was the intent of the motion? That was the intent, I apologize. Wrong, wrong language, but the intent, absolutely. Can everyone see this? Yes. Okay. okay. I will go ahead and uh, continue to, uh, Council Member Cummings, so we have a motion on the floor. Uh, Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. And um, I wanna just say thanks to the staff and to um, the developer for bringing this forward and the members of the community. You know, one of the things that um, really stands out to me as I was reading through this, um, this agenda report is just how much has been done to try to increase affordable housing in the community. So, you know, the, the purpose of the density bonus law is really, was really to try to get more affordable housing and make it feasible for developers. You know, our community passed measure O um, because we care about having more affordable housing. And even when you know staff worked with the Coastal Commission to, 
to update our LCP. You know, the it sounded like through um, through our gender reports that you know the the real reason why the or one of the main reasons why the Coastal Commission was in favor of increasing that height was because there was an argument made by the city that this would help for there to be more affordable housing in our community. And um, you know, in and in previous discussion, staff has brought up you know. In order to get more affordable housing, we need to restrict the housing. You know, there needs to be programs that are going to create more affordable housing. And I think this is an opportunity um, for us to try to work with a developer who's expressed interest in, you know, trying to make more affordable housing work, especially as it relates to Section 8 housing vouchers. And so um, I had a, a substitute motion I wanted to put on the floor, um, and I'd send it over to the clerk, but it would be to direct staff to work with the developer to discuss and attempt to negotiate a commitment of a specified number of units with a minimum of 15 units that would be that would increase the number of affordable housing affordable units through the use of section 8 housing vouchers and or the creation of a mechanism that would increase the number of affordable units through the use of section 8 housing vouchers prior to approving the project as a community benefit and um, there, there's one um, prior that's on um, line number four that should be stricken from that was a typo. So, uh, okay, if I could, um, I, I would second that, but I did want to clarify, um, uh, Councilmember Cummings, do you mean uh, an amendment to the mo main motion? Because that piece no. is just it's to um, the question around affordability. So we have the other items to also be considered. So are you proposing an amendment or I guess, I guess the reason why I was saying a substitute because if we, my hope is that if we could negotiate those benefits, they can be included and then if it comes back, we could approve everything. I mean, I just, and I just, I'm welcoming the folks on a way in, but I just imagine if we pass everything and we ask the staff to go and approve this or to try to negotiate this, then, um, you know, if, if there's, if the answer's no, then there's, you know, I think that, that we need to, you know, see if this discussion can be had so we pass everything all in one motion. Um, gotcha. So that was the intent of having it be a substitute motion is allowing for that discussion to happen. Because it sounds like, um, based on comments from the developers and based on comments from staff, there might be a way to make this work, but people aren't sure. And I think trying to hash that out this evening is probably not feasible, but if we can allow them to try to work this through and have it come back to us, you know, I think that there's an opportunity for us to be able to increase affordable housing. And the reason why I also added the second portion of uh, the creation of a mechanism is because obviously over time when units become vacant, there may be an opportunity to have some kind of 30 day policy where it's offered to section eight um, um, voucher holders. So just, you know, trying to create um, the opportunity for in the future for there to be people who can use Section 8 vouchers and, and get into housing. Um, so that was, the intent, that was the intent. Thanks for the clarification. So uh, yes, I'll second that. So we have um, Mr. Kondati and, and I'll need your guidance, just kind of, you know, armchair, armchair uh, quarterback with me here. So we have a substitute motion on the floor. Can we put that up, back up? I'm not sure that I caught that with the second. Uh, Tony, we have to vote on this substitute motion. <laughs> you have to vote on whether to accept the substitute motion. And then uh, if the council votes to accept the substitute motion, then you can call the question and vote on the motion. So for, for all the council members, hopefully that is clear. We The first step will be to accept this motion and then we would vote on the substitute motion. Um, I'll take a few minutes just to weigh in here. Um, I, I appreciate this approach. Um, and I also want to acknowledge um, the work that has been done by the applicant and um, the additional effort that they um, have come forward with in terms of um, their proposal to add uh, money into our uh, affordable housing trust fund as well as um, upwards, uh, potentially as much as a half a million dollars. Uh, I, I looks like there's a real commitment from them as well to look at um, not only just 
bringing the, the housing to the river, but also participating in sort of how the river will um, sort of be managed and maintained um, and some other benefits there. Uh, I've been run, running around on that river for a long time and um, was part of a lot of the planning work um, after the earthquake with regards to preparing um, some of the new plans on the river um, and participated in a large citizen committee that, that was convened by the council back then um, that actually prepared the San Lorenzo Urban River Plan. And um, in that process, we actually had, we had full consent about um, really around bringing um, some housing to this part of the river. Um, because of its uh, location next to transit and other things. Um, and I think what I'm, what I'm kind of reflecting on is, um, and, and many of our conversations kind of come to this point um, with regards to housing, uh, housing projects and, and, and development projects is that, um, you know, I think we all feel it's incumbent to get as much benefit and, and as much affordable housing out of every project. Um, but I think also the intent of, of some of the state law, um, and especially the um, the new the new law that you can't discriminate against people with Section 8 vouchers, which is an incredibly important uh, rectification of what was really um, not a functional system. Um, I think that that law and the recognition um, by the applicant actually and, and acknowledgement of that. Um, is really important that um, we're working with a developer and we're working with a set of, of um, folks who are wanting to do public benefit with regards to what, what um, kinds of outcomes may come from this project, especially connecting the river down to Front Street and then, a, you know, basically across um, what's going to become a much more active area. I think they're well aware of, of the obligation that comes with um, the new laws around Section 8. Uh, and I think, you know, 20 units is, is significant. Yeah, we would all want more units, but not every housing project that's going to come before the city of Santa Cruz is going to be able to accommodate all the things that we want. And I do believe that it's important that we recognize that, you know, we need a mix of housing types. Um, downtown is the perfect place to do that. Um, you know, I've talked to people who, you know, want to, retire and move into a small place like this downtown and have the flexibility to, you know, be here, but also, you know, not to have the burden of, of, of maintaining a large house or other things. I know that is a, a, a problem that not everyone shares in this town, um, but the fact that we have that kind of person in this town allows us to have more, more mobility in the rest of our housing market. And I think that that's something we often forget is that um, the way that we have a housing ecosystem is that we need bits and pieces of all kinds of housing so that we get that, that mobility between the different types of unit types. And so um, the most exciting thing I think about this project is I look at it in the context of the neighborhood that it's going to be in. And it is going to be a neighborhood that has, um, you know, well over 100 units of 100% of affordable housing across the street. With the um, with the metro project, the south and north um, Pacific project, um, we've got um, you know, some other market rate on the other side. We're hoping to have additional uh, affordability uh, in two other projects just block away. Um, obviously, we've we've already committed to the tannery and other projects along the river. Um, I think again, my my opinion um, as far as it goes is that I try to keep my eye on the fact that we need to create lots of different housing, and um, I think this project does that. Uh, and I think I've heard a really good commitment that uh, and a recognition of state law that, um, frankly, I didn't even know that that had occurred. So this this uh, ability for people with Section 8 vouchers to get access to housing is is just critical. So um, I really appreciate. <coughs> I really, really appreciate the, the motion at this point, but I, I feel that it is somewhat of a redundant attempt to basically um, try to, I, I under the, understand the intent, but I do think we're covered under the new state law under, with the Section 8 vouchers. And I think it's incumbent upon um, 
our economic development department and our planning department to be working with anyone who's building housing now to really understand what that is and to make sure we under, we're, we're communicating that as much as we can with regards to our existing housing stock. So I won't be able to support the motion. I do appreciate um, its intent, but um, I, am, um, I won't be voting for the substitute motion. So those are my comments. And, uh, and I will go ahead and um, call on uh, member, uh, call on Tari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Um, I was going to uh, speak to the first motion, but I'll, I'll just speak in general. I first want to thank the staff, um, Mr. Lawler and his team, for the incredible work that's been done over the years. I um, spent since Thursday night looking at the very thick agenda packet, um, the thorough information that was in there, uh, listening and watching the previous council meeting and reviewing all of the um, correspondence that have come in since then. Um, you know, this project is well thought out. It's aligned with multiple city plans as, as mentioned by Mr. Lawler and an outline in the agenda report. It also operationalizes the three pillars of our recently adopted framework of health and all policies, uh, that of health, equity, and sustainability. And it does this by really shifting our downtown culture to be a space that people can live, work, and recreate. Um, the project provides an opportunity to house a wide array of individuals and incomes, including young adults. Um, this is a group that I've worked extensively with that um, having, are really struggling with finding a place to live in our community. Um, yes, I, I agree with the um, comments around uh, we would we'd like to have more affordable housing. Um, and, and I think the, the, um, the direction that Councilmember Watkins proposed of pursuing an informal pro process to explore the um, providing preference to Section 8 vouchers for units that stay vacant for a certain amount of time, um, what Bonnie Lipscomb um, provided. So I think, I think if we could do that through an informal process and not delay this project any further um, would be the direction I'd like to go. Uh, you know, just... Uh, in, in looking at projects, there's always there's always a, a flaw in every project and every policy. And I think that if we stay in the loop of find the plot, find the flaw for every project, we really won't make any progress towards our vision of a vibrant community. Um, and we'll perpetuate the housing crisis, which of course impacts so many other of uh, the challenges we face in our community. So. Um, I think that this is, um, again, a well thought out project that is aligned and meets many of our city goals and visions and um, thanks for all the work that's gone into it. Thank you. And I've got council member Brown um, and Tony, I just wanna make sure that um, I'm doing this right in terms of, um, you know, just continuing to have dialogue, but we will go back and, and, and need to get back to that um, substitute motion, correct? Okay. Yes. Thanks. So yeah, I'll, I just wanna make a few comments uh, which are relevant both to the substitute motion and uh, the final vote on the, the initial motion, should we go that route. Um, so first, I just wanna say, I really wanna support a housing project. And I actually um, believe that this location and higher density location is appropriate. Um, you know, there are many, I'd like to see a number of changes to the project, um, many of which have been raised by members of the public, so I'm not gonna repeat them, but you know, related to design and height, um, the bike path, and uh, certainly, uh, you know, w would like to, having talked now for at least, you know, four years with Laura Bishop from the 418 Project, find a way forward to support their being able to be part of this project, I think, um, we absolutely uh, would want to encourage, uh, you know, creative spaces, spaces for, for people to engage in the kind of artistic activities that 418 uh, sponsors and promotes and, and makes space accessible for those activities. Um, and I recognize that we don't have uh, the discretion, we don't have discretionary authority for a lot of those things. So I'm, uh, while I'm, I'm just raising that here. I'm, I'm not suggesting that um, that would uh, per, those would be the basis upon which I determine my uh, support or opposition to this project. Um, I really want to support a housing project, um, and I've, I've just been frustrated that there have not been 
uh, projects coming to us that actually that make a, a real meaningful commitment to our affordability crisis. Um, I appreciate the constraints that you know developers have in financing, um, and at the end of the day, my responsibility is to the public interest and public benefit. And um, you know, I believe that there is a case to be made for uh, stacking the uh, inclusionary and density bonus affordable affordability requirements. I, I know that that is uh, not what our uh, legal counsel has uh, has suggested is is the way forward. But um, I think I've talked with other land use attorneys and affordable housing advocates and and I believe that this is up to interpretation and ultimately it might be settled in the courts at some point moving forward whether here or in another community um, and when it comes to the arguments about needing uh, you know a variety of housing options you know I recognize that that's important as well but I want to remind my colleagues and the public that we have exceeded our above market uh, RENA regional housing need assessment requirements. We have exceeded uh, our requirements and uh, on uh, market rate housing overall. We are woefully behind when it comes to uh, low income and very low income units that have been built. We are we are so far behind that it's, it's you know, it's kind of just, it doesn't, it's unfathomable to me that we would be supporting uh, high-end luxury uh, development, which is likely to bring uh, uh, a new mix of, uh, of residents to our community and, um, as was suggested, uh, likely uh, contribute to increasing our, media, our area median income, which will just exacerbate the problem for those who are not able to, um, you know, uh, who are working in, in those um, you know, low-paying low jobs that we depend upon as a community. Um, so, you know, I just, I, I just wanted to say that, um, you know, I think that uh, the, you know, the, the Coastal Commission's letter is um, not, certainly not definitive, but, um, you know, they've made a case that um, encouraging affordable housing is a priority and that public benefit is a priority. And I don't believe that simply building, uh, you know, space for commercial activity and high-end Housing is a public benefit in and of itself. I just disagree with that. Um, you know, the inclusionary requirements and the density bonus requirements um, are provided in our, you know, separate zoning code chapters. They're they're independent of each other. Um, and the staff, you know, the staff has said that um, the code does not say we are uh, required to uh, stack those and, and for those those requirements to be additive. It also doesn't say that they shouldn't. And so I think there is room for interpretation about our discretion in that regard. Uh, I'm sorry that we were not able to get some kind of uh, you know, more uh, positive response about the potential to use uh, Section 8 set-asides for meeting those requirements. And um, so, uh, you know, and I, I would hope that we could further that discussion before we approve this project uh, at the end of the day. Um, with that, I'll just uh, say that this is, these are my, my rationale for supporting the motion made by Councilmember Cummings, and um, uh, I'll leave it there. For, for now, thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Brown. Uh, Councilmember Golder. Thank you to everybody for your comments. It's given me a lot to think about. And um, one thing that um, I'd like to share, but I um, is that I've been in talks with the 418 project as soon as this afternoon, and they um, said with this whether they be in here or another spot, they're not gonna be going out of business and they're, they've got other spaces already kind of that they're working on. So that they're not going to share much more than that publicly yet, but I just wanted to share that. The other thing I would like to say is that while I am fully supportive of um, Council Member Cummings' intent with the substitute motion, I also think that having a project pencil out and have it actually get built is a benefit to the community. And when you think about the reasons that housing costs a lot and you think about the high cost of real estate, just the raw land in California, the value of that, then you talk, you add in the high higher wages that um, 
are paid here in California as opposed to you know other states or what what have you, it 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 tends to you know um, increase the cost of the project, and then to balance out if you don't want super luxury apartments. <laughs> Yeah, there, ha there has to be a perfect, you know, not, nothing thing for There has to be a balance where if we increase the amount of affordable units in this project, the, the, the developers will have to make the project pencil out in order to get the financing that they need. Then the other units are just going to cost more. And so I think um, finding that balance is really delicate. And so it's, I, I just think adding more restrictions by putting, um, that there has to be a certain number that are only to Section 8 would make it more complicated and might slow the process down and then increase the total cost overall, which would increase the rents in the long run. And so that's why I don't think I can support the substitute motion. Okay. Uh, I've got council member coming, and then I think I'd like to, if we can, um, take a vote on the substitute motion, and I've got uh, so, uh, Council Member Bruno. And Justin, did you? Yeah, I just I just put my hand down. So Sorry, sorry. okay, it, it was up and then it was down so quick. Okay, yeah, go ahead, please. So I just wanted to um, mention for the purposes of clarifying uh, to Council Member Golder's point, um, just so the public's aware, when the way that Section 8 housing vouchers are used, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, because I know there's some people who are very familiar with HUD and Section 8, is that um, the recipient of that voucher, they are gonna pay, they pay a subsidized rent, and the government then backfills that amount. So that what the, what the developer, the homeowner is making is actually the market rate. So the Section 8 actually wouldn't, it would actually allow for affordable units to be at market rate, but they'd be subsidized by this government program. And so that's kind of the impetus for using this as a mechanism because it actually would allow for the project to pencil out um, and would also lead to an increase in the number of affordable units. So I just wanted to say that because it sounded like there was um, a misunderstanding with the use of Section 8 housing vouchers and I wanted to make sure that that was clear. Thank you, uh, Council Member Bruno. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Uh, I, you know, this has been a really good discussion and I appreciate all of the information since Thursday when this packet was delivered and the correspondence and many uh, uh, questions answered since Thursday regarding many of the uh, points that have been brought up. And um, I think that, uh, I just wanna say thank you also for the due diligence to everyone involved with this and to all the points that have been brought up. I think it's really important to hear from you know, people in the community that have brought up points that maybe uh, some of us were not thinking of or were not aware of. And, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, that's important to take into consideration when we're making a decision with this. Uh, I, of, of all people, are really strongly for affordable housing. Uh, I've said that through my campaign and um, every day through um, supporting housing and affordable housing in this community is a priority and a uh, necessity. Uh, and we have to um, really do our best to support that in all ways. And with this uh, development, um, I, I just have to emphasize the 15 very low permanent, these restricted permanent homes are so key and needed. And um, I, I see that, um, you know, I, I think that with uh, uh, Council Member Cummings' uh, substitute motion, I, 
I'm curious about this process because I see that more as a direction to staff uh, to work with um, uh, Owen Lawler on on this. And uh, so I, I, I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Councilmember Berner. I think that um, we'll go ahead and um, take a vote. Uh, so the process is, is that we will vote to accept the sub substitute motion, correct, Tony? Yes. Depending on the outcome of that vote, then we would vote on the substitute motion, which would mean um, that the original motion um, is it would not be on the table at that point. Exactly. So I just want to make sure everybody, I know we have new council members, so this is all new. Um, and so what the substitute motion would be, if it, if it is approved, that would um, eliminate the original motion that council member Watkins uh, voted on. So let's go ahead and uh, I will call, uh, ask for a roll call vote on uh, accepting the substitute motion. Councilmember Watkins? No. Calentari Johnson? No. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? No. Vice Mayor Bruner? No. Mayor Myers? No. So that motion fails with Council Member Watkins voting no, Calentari Johnson voting no, Council Member Golder voting no, Council Member Bruner voting no, and Mayor Myers voting no, Council Member Brown voting yes, and Council Member Cummings voting yes. So with that decision, we'll move on to the original motion. And that motion was to accept the uh, staff recommendation, which includes adopting the resolution, certifying the environmental impact report, adopting the resolution, adopting the findings of fact, the mitigation monitoring and reporting program, and a statement of overriding considerations, excuse me, overriding conditions, an adoption of a resolution approving the non-residential demolition authorization permit, coastal permit, design permit, tentative map, special use permit, administrative use permit, revocable license for outdoor extension area, heritage tree removal permit, and street tree removal, and the addition of condition, I need that language, uh, I'm not sure who has it. Sam, do you have that? Anybody have that up? The additional language in the um, condition? Yes. Yeah. How do we refer, how do I refer to that in the motion? Is that the December, uh, January 12th condition? Uh, let's see. Um, it's, it's this condition here. Okay. Oh, I guess I does this have a name or do I, how do I refer to it? They just refer to it the condition added on January 12th. Um, I'm, I might state as revised on January 12th. Okay. And I will take a ro roll call vote. I have mine, I had a comment. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Uh, Thank I you. think it's this whole, Samantha, isn't it the whole, this is, can you go up a little bit on your screen? Oh, I see where it says, and as an additional condition. Okay, got it. New condition of approval, local coast. So it's all it's all of the bullets there. Yes, this is the the finding that would be included in the resolution, and then this is the new condition of approval. It goes down to the second page. Got it. Great. Thank you. Um, so, is there a clarification you need, Council Member Cummings, before I call the vote? I just had a question and want to just make a, a brief com or, or comment. Okay, please go ahead. Um, so I don't know if maybe somebody from, and maybe, I mean, this is related, um, but I'm just curious if there's any information on how the state is 
tracking, or if we can get information back on how the state is tracking the um, the new regulations around Section 8, because um, while, you know, there's not supposed to be discrimination um, for housing, we've heard people in our community um, over time feel like they've been discriminated um, based on the race or sexual orientation. And so I think it would be really important uh, moving forward that we, you know, determine how we're going to track <clears throat> whether or not landlords and property owners are, are discriminating based on Section 8, because my hope would be that, you know, after this building's built, some of these units, some people with Section 8 vouchers could get into these units, but um, I, you know, if there's not a way to track what, like, how that's happening and um, where the discriminatory practices are happening, I think it's going to be really difficult for the state uh, and our community to enforce that. And then I just also wanted to, to say um, that I do actually appreciate this project and what it's going to do for the river. I do believe that um, this project has the potential for uh, activating that space in a, in a much more positive way. Um, recently, or a couple years ago, I went back to Chicago, and along the Chicago River, they used to not have, there used to be a lot of um, vacant, unused space, and they, when they, after they reactivated it by putting in businesses and, and, um, and bars and places for people to hang out and restaurants, it really created this um, really inviting and vibrant space around the river. And so um, I'm hoping that with some of the projects that we have coming forward that we'll see the river turn into a very active space. Um, but, you know, I think as we've been discussing um, and as Councilmember Brown pointed out, we have a substantial amount of um, market rate housing in our community that is above and beyond our arena goals. And, um, you know, some of this housing at this point, you know, due to COVID, uh, they are, you know, a lot of these market rate units are offering incentives for people to move in. And a lot of that's because people can't afford to live there. And, you know, when we think about how badly people have been impacted these days um, by COVID and the, through the loss of jobs and the loss of income, having affordable units is going to really be critical and um, and really trying to, you know, make sure that we're not gentrifying our community because even if seniors can move out of the houses that they're in uh, into some of these units, um, for example, you know, those units that are going to become vacant oftentimes are then jacked to market rate or to higher rates. And, um, and so, you know, we're, we're building a lot more market rate units. And while we're building, you know, more affordable as well, I think we really need to continue to ensure that um, we bring down the cost of living in Santa Cruz. We're the fourth most expensive place to live in the world um, when you look at cost of housing to median income. And as a tourist community, we really need to continue to push for policies and to push for more, that, that increase affordable housing and more affordable housing. So I'm just going to say that because um, while I'm, I think this project has a lot of good that it's going to contribute to the community, um, given that, you know, um, we're not going to be able to take a, a couple more weeks to try to maximize that affordable housing, I can't uh, support the project at this time. So those are, that's the end of my comments. Um, and, yeah, I hope we can continue trying to find ways to increase affordable housing in our community. Thank you. And uh, Council Member uh, Watkins, did you have a comment? Or, but, but I was trying to get this. Oh, oh. I think down. Okay. I, have, I do have a really quick comment. Okay. I just really want to thank and acknowledge Peter for being on here this evening as well and providing access to our Spanish speaking community members. And thank you, Mayor Myers, for um, and for setting that up. I think it's really essential. So I just, I had thought about that earlier and I just needed to say it. So thank you for giving me that moment. Thanks very much. Okay, we will do a roll call vote on the motion. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Aye. Council, uh, excuse me, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Aye. Council Member Brown. No. Council Member Cummings. No. Council Member Golder. Aye. Council Member Bruner. Aye. And Mayor Myers votes aye. The motion passes with Council Member Watkins voting yes, Council Member Kalantari voting yes, Council Member Brown voting no, Council Member Cummings voting no, Council Member Golder voting yes, 
Vice Mayor Bruner voting yes, and Mayor Myers voting yes. The motion passes five, five yeses to two no's. And that concludes this item for this evening. Um, I do want to reach, I do just want to reiterate, um, all, uh, thank the staff um, for all of their work. This was an incredibly complicated project. Um, just a huge amount of um, work done on all the um, policy analysis and working with the applicant. I wanna thank the applicant. I wanna thank my fellow council members. Um, these are hard decisions and I appreciate everybody's comments this evening. And um, we'll move on to our final item of the evening, which is um, oral communications. Oral communications, um, is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture the meeting in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required. Please remember that this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each other, with each member of the public, but we, when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been completed. And I see, Bonnie, it looks like we have three attendees in, in our, uh, with three hands raised. So I will go ahead and start. This is for oral communications. And just again, this is for items not listed on today's agenda. Uh, I see phone number 1810. Please go ahead. Yes, leftist city sanctioning an out of town native activist, obsessive 200 year old grievance mongering with a privileged platform was not prior a proper city business, but is typical of leftists elevating victimization relevance of stale events, ignoring that with each new day, the past becomes less relevant. The El Camino Bells road marker agenda items, false pretense fabricated those bells as a glorification symbol of indigenous oppression, despite never being such when it's juxtaposition, consider we have our own disingenuously installed, authentically real, present day glorification symbol of violent Marxist anarchists, vandalism, arson, assault, looting of BLM terror, right in front of City Hall. The leftists aren't interested in removing that actual and currently relevant violent mob glorification symbol or instructing 10-year-olds in the wider gory details of that movement's Marxist Malcolm X inspired destabilizing destructive hate-filled mob anarchy revolution, regime change, and other motives despite our failed educational system's stale oppression obsessions. Uh, the other removal fib that mission, mission history has not been told does not make for a choice the 2015 indigenous inspired desecrating hate crimes meted out against Catholic Church Hudipracera statuary after canonization sainthood, which produced huge volumes of similar angry published narratives, and the truthful scholarly record of events has been told. Your agenda mock revelation version sufficiently hid by 100% of mission. The horrific native population reduction was instead truthfully due mostly to defenseless deaths from deadly European diseases, food resource issues, and a later post-mission event, and not as solely expressed and implied purposefully all done by missionaries, which slanted your narrative into one-dimensional mudslinging. Epidemics are not genocide, nor are converted natives into proxy colonist farmer ranchers that intended them to live as colonists, not die. Stakeholders should be ejected boot to rear if they associate mission history as genocide with inappropriate modern-day moral judgments instead of a severe epic tragedy in a different time. Time. Update Val that churches of today are compassionate and charitable, and it's time for forgiveness and acceptance after 200 years, which in no way denies ancient brutalities, terrorized natives, or the catastrophic consequences of colonization. Thanks. Next is caller with the last four digits, 3135.
Bonnie. Hi, I believe I got four minutes for group time. Is that correct? I was not notified uh, of your request for the four minutes. I sent you an email three days ago. I did not receive it. Uh, I don't know why. It was you're, you're a D Myers, the city of Santa Cruz, right? Yes, but I did not receive your request. Well, are you prepared to let me go ahead, or are you going to allow that to stop me? I will give you four minutes this evening, Mr. Norris. You know, I'll send you a copy of it to show you I'm not I'm not trying to mislead you, Donna. Okay, here's the story. I'm a little concerned that there's nothing on the city council agenda tonight regarding the issue of the edict issued by uh, city, city manager Martine Bernal that has now led to what may be a rather costly lawsuit. But even more important, it would be, it seems a particularly outrageous behavior in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of winter, in a situation of fiscal crisis, to be using police funding to drive people away into what amounts to the downtown area and other neighborhoods. This is a similar argument and a similar problem that we had a year and a half ago with the Ross camp, but it's even more pressing in the times of this pandemic. So naturally, people went to court and said, hold it, and the judge agreed, and has agreed again today. As you probably know already, the temporary restraining order granted a week ago has in fact been continued for another week as the city attorney and his deputies frantically flail about looking for pretexts to claim that they have some kind of alternate shelter or affordable housing, which they don't. And that's pretty, which pretty much well known. It was admitted to the judge, and the judge kind of, <laughs> you know, cocked her head and looked at them. Anyway, the community needs to know that their resistance work at San Lorenzo Park has paid off in the absence of this council's authority in, in its refusal to take any action in the winter, lolling away on winter vacation while other people are out there freezing and facing COVID, and then also facing the police. It's incredibly, well, I think it's both stupid in terms of any kind of actual solution of the situation, even on a short-term basis. So I'm, I'm urging the community to, again, mobilize to assist this community. This is where the city council will not. I also want to note that there was a violent police assault on a disabled epileptic activist, a guy called Eric, who's a partner to Alicia Cool of the Santa Cruz Homeless Union. You know, the real one, not the phony union that you had, you gave special presentation time to that has no union, but there actually is a union that's suing you in court. They're the real union, as you know. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the details of this case, but you need to, and if anybody here is interested, I suggest perhaps Sandy Brown, perhaps Justin Cummings, perhaps two of the new incoming council members, perhaps you, Donna, you are the mayor. And I've also requested, of course, an interview with you in case you wish to go into some detail about what you, your platform and your program is regarding people who are outside. There's continued harassment of RVs around Delaware Avenue. People do not have places to go. There is a limited Association of Faith Communities uh, RV and, and vehicular safe zone area, but it is insufficient. And in this, in this situation that we're in particularly, it's important that police let people shelter in place. And the kind of right-wing activism that alarms some communities that we saw in Washington, D.C. last week is apparently perfectly acceptable here in, in Santa Cruz against homeless people, particularly it seems to be even uh, connected with the police department, where people like Deborah Elston of Next Door uh, doesn't mind multiply ticketing people who have no funding, whose only survival is their vehicles. I think this is outrageous, and I would expect the community to stand up and feel the same way, and I think perhaps some of them do. In any case, these kind of sum up a few of the points that I think you need to consider here. Uh, people are not liking this. I'm not just talking about Trump supporters. I'm talking about people who are poor in this community where you build these massive, non-affordable projects masquerading as affordable housing, you're, put, you're in a situation where there's 
no real housing and no real shelter and no winter shelter. You also refuse to do any winter sheltering. So I'll leave it at that. Community, you take action where this mayor and this council will not. Thank you. The next caller is ending in 3135, please. Go ahead. Good evening. My name is Janine Roth, and I am a Santa Cruz City resident. I'm also um, calling to talk about the dispersal of people in San Lorenzo Park. And I just wanted to say that I hope you're disappointed in the manager and the parks director approached that dispersal. Firstly, they chose to do it under the cover of a holiday break when automated voicemails and emails told citizens of residents of the city that the city was off until January. Secondly, they used the pandemic as part of the justification and the authorization, and yet the dispersal was explicitly against CDC guidance regarding encampments. We heard earlier this evening that the pandemic is at crisis. And the communications, you know, the executive order was all about city resources and money in a manner that is insensitive and inhumane. If this were another wildfire, we'd consider those affected by homelessness as our community and have all sorts of positive, here's what you can do messages. But for the homeless, it's only, here's why they are a problem. In fact, I understand that Chief Mills wants to present an ordinance to effectively criminalize homelessness. That's not acceptable. They are not other, they are people in our community. I know you're hearing from unhappy residents who support dispersal. I do hope that they're not also the ones that complain to you about development projects. I also hope they're not the ones who voted against Measure H, which would have brought money for more homeless services and housing. Some of us are just simply unhappy because your plan appears to be to repeat cycles of displacement. And you know, I am tired of hearing that a problem for the city is that the county gets all the money. What do you want a city resident to do with that? I want to help. So help us, help you, help the community. Thank you for an opportunity to speak. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is with the phone uh, flat four digits of 4409, please. You can go ahead. Hi there, this is uh, Danny Drysdale. I am a city resident and I am the SSP coordinator for the Harm Reduction Coalition in Santa Cruz County. I'm also calling in uh, about the dispersal of folks at the San Lorenzo Park. Um, yeah, just as a local service provider uh, who does a lot of work with our unhoused community, I'm also distressed by this order, um, especially distressed by the way that it happened over the holiday break um, without you know, action from council. I think that is setting a very scary precedent and also is just like uh, not the way that we should be addressing this situation, especially in the midst of this pandemic. Um, as others have already said, this, this sweep does go against CDC guidelines very strongly. Um, Gail Newell did say that she wouldn't have supported this if advised, but she wasn't even advised on this. I think if we are gonna take actions that are uh, supposedly to address the COVID-19 pandemic, then we should be following the lead of our public health professionals and champions like Gail. Um, so yeah, as someone who does a lot of work in, that, in, in this area, I, I, I think it's scary to think that all those folks are gonna get swept along. I was there um, on the first day of the sweeps, the, the, the ones that went through um, before everything got paused by the court situation. And it was you know really hard for folks to try and move their stuff that quickly. Um, had a conversation through a translator with a monolingual Spanish speaker who had no idea the sweeps were gonna happen because there's nothing posted in Spanish. Um, and he had to have folks that were just there that day like translate for him to explain what was going on. I think that that is also like, this shouldn't be happening at all, but at least you know a sign in Spanish would be nice for people um, who aren't gonna be able to read signs posted only in English. And then beyond that, yeah, I think this is just like a really dangerous time to be uh, to possibly, you know, to, or to be dispersing people throughout the community and possibly increasing the spread of COVID. It's gonna make it harder for service providers to access these people, and I think it's a huge mistake. And I think there should be council action to reverse it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, 
final, final speaker for oral communications has a phone number ending in 2377. You can go ahead and speak, please. Is it star six, um, Bonnie, to unmute? You should be able to unmute yourself by pressing star six and you're, we're, we're ready to hear you speak. This is for number 2377, ending in number 2377. There you go, thank you. Yeah, Nicholas Whitehead. As we march into a brand new year, an old unresolved problem faces us outside our homes. The dilemma of unhoused people in large numbers in our streets, in camper vehicles, tents, in our parks. We have to unite as a community in a reasonable, sensible manner to reach some agreement on what is permissible and what is impossible to accept. We need to combine our best thoughts and our power of will to design programs that provide more survival space and essential services to homeless population. At the same time, we must insist on more personal responsibility from individuals depending on our goodwill and tolerance. We need to combine every sector of our society in a common effort to re-envision this whole human degradation. That means the business community, the taxpaying property owners, past and present members of the judiciary, the legal profession, law enforcement, people from labor unions, human service providers, and communities of faith. And we must include groups who are concerned with the welfare of children, teenagers at risk, unhoused families, homeless seniors, and disabled people out on the street. Until we, the public, create a better vision of the way ahead, there will remain a need for emergency survival in camps. Fortunately, a dynamic visionary, Mr. Brent Adams of Footbridge Group, has drafted a well-conceived proposal for responsibly run transitional tent camps, a big improvement on the current unmanaged camps. City Council of Management, please, you need to take a thorough look at these proposals from the Footbridge Group. And I wish you well in the coming year. Thank you. Seeing no other hands up, um, I will go ahead and conclude our meeting for this evening. Uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Goodbye.